question. Senator Lucas, is that you back there? Yeah, thank you. Mr. Secretary, yes, sir. I, I'm hearing complaints from my local board of elections and surrounding smaller counties about the necessary equipment that goes with the machine so they can train folks. Uh, they say there are other components that goes to the voting machine that they don't have. Uh, they should, we have a delivery schedule for the counties. Uh, and if you, I'll circle back and we'll, we'll uh, find out what counties those are and I'll get back to you with a complete detailed schedule. But uh, with House Bill 316, we're supplying all the equipment. We also added, you know, in the bond money, the security panels. Uh, primarily what the counties would be looking at would be looking at, you know, additional tables. The, the nationwide, we are, everyone in the country is going towards a different vendors, obviously, five or seven different vendors, but people are going to a verifiable paper ballot. And so what that necessitates is it takes up more space because now you have a printer and now you have a ballot scanner. So there's a more, you know, space from that. So there may be new tables or devices to hold the equipment on there. But uh, we have uh, our schedule and I'll, you know, circle back with your office and we can get that for all the counties that you represent. Well, I mean, I, I say that because we got elections in March and a lot of these folks are, you know, leery about the machine, so you want to get them out so folks can test them and that kind of stuff. Well, Senator, um, I'm over the implementation. Let me get into the weeds of this a little bit more. Right now, 46 of the election management systems, which is the main part of the system, are being used for a third round of training. We're training all elections officials from all 159 counties on that system last week and this week. Once those are done, by February 1st, every county will have their election management system in hand so they can begin the UACAVA, which is the military and overseas votes, um, by February 4th, which is the cutoff time to begin that process. Um, on top of that, every county has had, since October, the necessary equipment to work on poll worker training, which is the scanners, the ballot marking device, which consists of the touch screens and printers, as well as the ballot boxes, so that they're, they have the necessary equipment to show their poll workers and elections officials how those can function. We've gone through a third round of training now around the state for all 159 counties. We also went to the Gavrio Conference in Savannah in December and did more training along those lines there. We're adopting rules that will cover how we implement this system um, on the 23rd. So we are well along on that, and every we have a co county call twice a week now where people can ask us questions and, and have any of these things directed straight to our office to have those questions answered. So right now we are ahead of schedule in terms of getting the actual equipment out the door, and we are on time to both run our special elections in House District 171 and Senate 13, as well as do another audit which is another test of how to do an audited paper trail system, uh, likely with Lee County, that hasn't been confirmed yet. We feel like if there's a specific county that has a specific question, they have our numbers, they can call us, and we, we talk to them every single day. So we feel like we're in good shape with this. And there's always gonna be people, unfortunately, when you're going to 159 counties, some are gonna be first, some will be last to get the equipment. Right now, 87% is scheduled to get out the door. So uh, by, I think by February 4th, every county will know the exact time that all of their equipment will be in place. Representative Holcomb, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Raffenberger, you caught my attention with your statement about the sequ sequestration of the DREs. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? My guess is Judge Totenberg ordered that in, in the federal case, and do you have a sense of how long uh, they're going to be sequestered for? Uh, that, is uh, that is the judge that ordered that, and she didn't provide a timeline. So uh, it's indefinite as far as we know. Um, They've been decertified for use, and they're being brought back out from, the, from all the counties as we collect equipment. So uh, we'll be storing those until notified otherwise by the court. Okay, thanks. Okay, Mr. Secretary, that appears to be all the questions you've got. Thanks, Sorry Mr. Chairman. about that. And uh, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. And we will see you all soon, and I'm sure we'll be talking a great deal more. Thank you. Commissioner Eaton, you don't look anything like Bubba McDonald. <laughs> Poor substitution. <laughs> Next up on our agenda is Public Service Commission, and uh, Commissioner Eaton is here to bring to us a quick update on the PSC and what they've got going on. Hey, hey. Mr. Commissioner, the, the podium is yours. Mr. Chairman, members of the Joint Committee, 
appreciate you giving me the opportunity to present today, and I'll, I'll get right to it. The, uh, you know, to really understand the essence of the Public Service Commission, we're an economic development agency, and uh, when, agent, when, when industry considers relocating to Georgia, the utility infrastructure, the prices they pay, those are huge factors that go into that. You can talk to any, any site consultant out there, any relocation consultant, and what Georgia's done here is we're a very competitive state, we're a reliable state. It's not true in all the states. For instance, in a state like California with over-regulation over mandates, pushing initiatives past the free market, it's caused rolling blackouts and very high prices. Their prices are almost, uh, uh, they're, they're well over 50% higher than what we're paying here in Georgia. Uh, within two years, Georgia's largest economic development project, Plant Vogels, Plant Vogels three and four reactors will be coming online. This will provide clean and reliable energy that will be the envy of the South and the entire United States. It'll be an industry recruitment tool, and they will also require financial and safety regulators with knowledge and experience beyond what the PSC has today. These are not regulators we can hire off the street. We should be hiring and training these regulators today. Uh, we just finished a major We approved rating increases with specific specific And there will be lots of meetings, lots of caseload, lots of dockets, lots of work for our employees. So getting specifically to the fiscal year 2020 budget, which includes a little over $10 million in state funds, this is a very small budget compared to a lot of uh, major agencies that you'll see. And to meet the governor's initial goal of a 4% cut, we would need to remove about $402,000 from our budget but uh, the proposed budget increase actually has the PSC at a 4.8% cut. So now we must cut 484 with an additional $82,000. And when we look at that, we're, we're, we're down to the bone. And that $82,000 is, uh, you know, I, I look at that really from an employee standpoint. And so to make this goal, we've already taken actions to maximize federal funds in an amount of $70,000. We've suspended our dues to our, our training partners for $60,000 in savings. This is our national organization that provides valuable research to us, especially with what's going on in energy today with, with solar, all the technology that's out there. We will no longer have access to that information. Uh, we've reduced discretionary spending by $77,000, administrative cost restructuring of $40,000, and we have two employees that have left and we will not rehire those positions for a 2020 savings of $60,000. And so that remains a shortfall of $176,000 and our only ability to do that at this point is through staff furloughs. Uh, during the Great Recession, the PSC reduced employees from 106 to 80. Currently, we have 83 positions filled. So in other words, we are virtually the same staffing level as we were in the pit of this recession. And so the PSC employees, as I mentioned before, were ensuring energy costs to ratepayers remain low. Pipeline inspectors keep the gas line safe. If you indulge me for one minute, if, if you, you read about many times when we have rate cases, and I think a lot of folks, especially in the media, think that we start with zero and just decide how much are we gonna give the utility that year. But what these are is these are litigated hearings and they come at us with a litigated position and that position is high and essentially our staff for lack of a better way of putting it they're almost on an easter egg hunt and they're looking for those eggs in the filings and the less staff that we have the less experience that we have the less we will be able to identify these issues and have a proper litigation uh, position ourselves and we'll be more at the mercy at whatever utility files at this position because as I mentioned before it's not starting at zero and deciding what we're going to give them is starting at their litigated position and deciding what we're going to take away um, so to, to deal with this all we are implementing five furlough days through the end of this fiscal year for each employee including 
uh, commissioner starting in February and through the rest of the fiscal year. And so, you know, we're, we're I know we've heard from a lot of agencies today, but we are we are way down to the bone. It's, it's really just about labor at this point. There is no discretionary spending left. So respectfully, I'd ask that, uh, you know, you consider our PSC budget, how small it is relative to the impact that we have across the state. Uh, consider uh, the PSC work has a direct effect on customer service regarding ratepayers, both residential and industry. And consider the PSC budget is now facing a higher percentage cut than uh, even the 4% that, that had been proposed. And so uh, if we could, even if we could get it below the 4% cut, this would still require furlough days, but obviously it would not require as many as we have planned for the 48 so again, thank you very much for hearing what we have to say today, and I'm open to any questions. Well, it appears that uh, that uh, Brother McDonald coached you pretty well. I thought that was him standing up there. For <laughs> <laughs> I do want to ask you, what are the what are projected start dates on three and four now? Uh, the projected start dates are is it uh, 22? November 21 and 22. November 21 and 22. Okay, thank you. Number 30, Chair Lady Houston. Thank you so much. Uh, could you tell me how these cuts will affect the federal funds that we receive? Well, we, we, we've, uh, we've taken steps to maximize those at this point, although the pipeline safety staff will be subject to the furlough days as well. Is that correct, Mr. Pritchard? So there, 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 there would be slight reduction in those funds, a slight reduction, but of course, if we continue to continue moving in that direction, we will have to uh, let folks, we will have to reduce that department as well. Well, what about, uh Okay, if you reduce that, you get fees from that when they make a, it, an error and not doing right, don't you find them? No, absolutely, uh, we do, and I have that in my notes. How much I, uh, fine money did you bring in? We, we, we bring in, um, we bring in the PSC returned $550,000 of the general fund from fines assessed to violators before the call before you dig, and really we're not maximizing that area as well as we could. If we added a couple employees in that area, they would more than pay for themselves by bringing in more fine dollars. Okay, and so you're gonna have to cut some of those people that are that are doing that. Uh, not in a 2020 budget. We're gonna have to do furlough days across the board, but we're, but we're not we're not we're not cutting. cutting We've had two employees leave that we're not replacing those positions, but we won't be cutting anybody in the pipelines of safety department. Okay. Thank you. Chairman Pruitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this may not be a budget-related oh, issue, you are. but I just wondered, uh, in rural Georgia, there's a lot of us that are, have issues with not having enough natural gas, and I wonder if there was anything in the plans to uh, promote moving natural gas or bringing more natural gas to rural Georgia. Well, we, you know, we, we've considered, we, we've, we've, con we've continued to work with a USF fund and try to you know, we, we, we have a number of uh, funds that we work with in trying to expand a development in natural gas. You've got a, a wonderful advocate now in the Public Service Commission and Jason Shaw, and uh, he's uh, obviously constantly advocating for the rural part of the state. It's, it's picking and choosing which projects to do. We get a lot of economic development requests, and we, we do our best to objectify those by seeing what the return of those added pipelines will be. But uh, all I can say to you, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, you know we do have programs in place. We, we are very aware of the need to expand uh, for, for, for industry and agriculture in the rural areas of the state. Uh, you know, we'll continue to do that. And if, if you've got specific projects in mind, I'd be happy to talk to you about those. Thank you. Mr. Commissioner, that appears to be all of the questions that you have. We appreciate it, and I'm sure that there'll be more conversations as we go on over the next several weeks. 
Thank you very Thank much, you. Chairman England. Appreciate right. it. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, DCA Commissioner Nunn. Y'all be listening fast because he's going to be talking fast. You're going to get about 45 minutes worth of stuff in 30 years. So <laughs> I don't know where he learned to talk as quick as he does, but we're glad to have him. Thank you for being here with us. And, and uh, in mind of time, I'm going to turn the podium on over to you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Chairman England, you're right. I'm going to try to talk fast so I can entertain questions. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Chairman England, Vice Chairman Tillery, uh, members of the committee and other guests, it's an honor to be with you today and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the governor's budget recommendations. Um, I feel particularly privileged to, uh, to occupy that coveted early afternoon spot on your calendar. So uh, <laughs> uh, I certainly uh, appreciate your attention and commitment to our important responsibility. I wish I could make the subject matter more enter entertaining, but um, I, the um, we, we were instructed, and y'all are aware, uh, that we were to look at our agencies and scrutinize our spending uh, to sharpen our pencils in a challenging budget environment. I assure you that we have a keen appreciation for the difficult work of prioritizing resources uh, and program activities, all of which are vitally important. Um, as a reminder, DCA is the state's community development agency. We are responsible for comprehensive housing or comprehensive planning for housing, for community development, economic development, finance. Um, and, and we operate with about 70 different programs that provide technical assistance and financial resources, uh, incentives to help build strong communities throughout the state. Uh, it's my honor to lead the organization, and I'm extremely proud of the DCA team, uh, as well as the quantity and quality of work that we're able to deliver with the resources that we have. Um, it is our commitment to continue to improve the programs and services that we deliver, uh, and our team has worked diligently to further streamline uh, our programs, our processes, and technology. Um, as I present our budget recommendations today, I understand you're working from the governor's budget report. Um, so uh, all of my recommendations, I'm just going to track with that document. I had intended to uh, share a PowerPoint, uh, which I have KO'd because uh, it's, uh, it's fairly redundant. Um, but if I, if I did share that PowerPoint, you would see uh, that our total reductions total about $5.3 million uh, in the amended budget and then uh, about $8.3 million uh, in the FY21 budget. I also understand the nature of our agency uh, and imagine that each of you has a personal interest in one program or another. Uh, if you could see from, the, uh, from the, uh, the, the slide that I plan to share, and uh, Mr. Chairman, you've already alluded to it, I've got a lot to cover, so I will move very quickly, um, starting with the amended budget and then moving into our FY21 recommendations. Um, so, so first, uh, and I'm, I'm working from page 111 uh, in your budget document. Um, starting with coordinated planning, there are two uh, budget items to address. First is a $140,186 reduction to the state's planning contracts uh, with each of the 12 regional commissions. Um, each regional commission enters into an annual contract with DCA to provide planning assistance to, uh, to, to local governments, i.e. cities and counties across the state who are responsible for meeting comprehensive planning requirements, um, particularly those smaller communities uh, that lack the internal resources to execute this responsibility rely on the regional commission's assistance. Uh, so the impact of this recommendation will be formulaic and should amount to between ten dollars and $15,000 per regional commission. Second, uh, we propose an elimination of $90,000 in annual payments to the Department of Audit for the Regional Commission Performance Audit. Now, the performance audits are at the end of a five-year review cycle, which has proven extremely constructive and beneficial. Um, and we're open to scoping uh, a streamlined audit program. However, the $90,000 payment from one state agency to another state agency uh, seems imprudent in a tight budget environment. Um, so moving on to departmental administration, uh, first there is a small uh, DOAS enterprise adjustment. Um, next, next item number two, uh, we've simply eliminated a $15,000 um, FY20 budget item that related to the commission on the Holocaust. Um, this was included in Governor Kemp's uh, non-binding language disregards uh, earlier this year, so we've reflected it here in the amended budget. 
And then finally, uh, we recommend, finally under this uh, uh, program area, we're recommending a reduction of $56,225 for the Georgia Advocacy Office. Um, after some discussion with OPB, uh, it was determined that this program is somewhat redundant uh, with the Governor's Office of Disability Services Ombudsman. Um, that's a mouthful. Uh, and um, this amended FY20 uh, reduction reflects one quarter of the full year funding for that program. I'm going to move on to the uh, Federal Community and Economic Development Program budget. And uh, we only have one item in the amended budget to recommend, and that relates to the Appalachian, Appalachian Regional Commission. Uh, ARC is an important community and economic development tool. Uh, it's uh, available to our northernmost 37 counties. And as part of a 13-state Appalachian region, uh, we are assessed annually to support the operations of this federal-state partnership. Um, in return, we receive uh, several million dollars, about four million dollars last year uh, in federal funds to address uh, economic development and community development issues in rural Appalachia. Now, several years ago, this assessment spiked uh, due to a change in the methodology. Uh, and at that time, the One Georgia Authority stepped in to fund the Delta. Uh, given the fact that these programs are very similar um, in terms of their focus on economic development, um, the focus on rural Georgia, as well as the importance of unlocking these federal funds. Uh, now, while that assessment, the ARC assessment, has leveled off, a small amount continues to be funded by the One Georgia Authority, and we are simply re uh, recommending eliminating the $130,000 um, variable line item from our DCA budget uh, and moving that entire variable expense to One Georgia. Under uh, regional services, as I continue along, you'll note a $60,000 add in the amended budget for the purchase of three vehicles for regional staff. Um, many of you are familiar with our regional representatives who live and work in the state's 12 service delivery regions. Uh, and in fact serve as a face of DCA to the communities we serve. Um, now, not only do they provide information and technical assistance, but they also help us to monitor state investments in these communities. Uh, of course, this requires that they travel within their regions very regularly, uh, and due to the unique nature of several regions, um, some have particularly high mileage, annual mileage reimbursement. Uh, after discussing with OPB, uh, it was determined that purchasing uh, several vehicles to be assigned to individuals would result in long-term savings, um, hence that, uh, that addition in the amended budget. I'll move now to research and surveys, and we currently have one vacant position uh, in this part of our agency, and we're proposing the elimination of that position. Uh, that should result in a $64,754 savings. Um, you know, just as background, DCA uh, is responsible for seven uh, annual reports and surveys, such as the local authority registration, the report of local gov government finances, uh, the hotel motel tax reports. Um, it's our plan to pursue every opportunity to streamline these activities uh, as we continue to evaluate these reports and our ability to, to deliver them. Uh, moving on under special housing initiatives, under the special housing initiatives budget, um, the statewide independent living council um, funding is proposed to be reduced by $100,000 to its FY18 level. Uh, this program provides accessibility assistance for uh, disabled individuals uh, through grants to help retrofit individuals' homes so that the disabled are able to safely navigate within their, uh, within their own homes. Um, now this is similar to several programs at DHS under the Division of Aging. Uh, and for background, in FY19, Silk spent $198,000 to assist 28 disabled homeowners. Uh, the prior year, in FY18, Silk was able to assist 13 homeowners with $99,000 uh, in funding. And we believe that Silk will continue to support individuals in need, uh, even at this reduced funding level. Under, um, under state community development, uh, still in the amended budget, there's several items to address. First, 
uh, is the recommended illumination of $300,000 intended for the blight removal and code enforcement program or the BRACE program. Uh, and you may recall uh, this is a new program included in the FY20 budget uh, and it was intended to address uh, issues of blight by providing small grants to rural communities to lease dumpsters for residents to dispose of unwanted items that might otherwise become eyesores or blight. Um, now, blight is a significant uh, issue for many communities, and I think that our partners at GMA and ACCG would tell you, uh, tell you the same. And I know that this is a very well-intentioned program, albeit a small drop in the bucket. Unfortunately, uh, the, the program came with no administrative funding, uh, and DCA simply has no resources, particularly once I get through all of these recommendations, uh, with which to implement this program. Um, second, under this program budget, uh, we propose eliminating $75,000 for the Cobb County military support. Um, now this funding was actually intended to match federal grant dollars that apparently did not renew this year. Uh, the the uh, recipient of these funds actually notified us early in the year uh, that they would not need these funds, hence their elimination. Uh, also in our recommendations are a savings, uh, our savings of $85,798 through the elimination of a position in community development. Um, and this actually relates to an FY21 agency recommendation, which I'll share momentarily, uh, regarding the elimination of a program. Uh, however, the amended budget reduction will require us to, an elim to eliminate a position that is not yet vacant. Um, moving on, so state economic development. Uh, there are three items. First, the DCA proposes the elimination of uh, one part-time community and economic development position uh, that, that really supports all of our economic development programs. Uh, we operate with a very lean staff. Um, in many cases, I've got one person that is uh, solely responsible for multiple state programs. And historically, we had relied on this individual to provide assistance uh, you know, when there were demands, uh, when, when, when they were available to meet demands of our programs and, uh, and customers. However, this individual uh, left the agency uh, in the summer of last year, and it's simply impossible to replace that knowledge on a part-time basis, thus the elimination of uh, $27,588 uh, in that program budget. Um, the second line item here uh, is the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame. This was a $50,000 pass-through that was included in the governor's uh, veto disregard language last year. And then finally, number three, uh, we're recommending a further reduction of $500,000 to the REBA program, um, which provides discretionary economic development grant funding. Uh, as you are aware, uh, we were given specific targets for our proposed budget recommendations. Uh, and, um, and when we had to scrutinize every aspect of our state funding, REBA makes up a large percentage of our state funds. Um, we, we, we evaluated this program closely and upon uh, review of the economic development pipeline, prior year trends and discussion with our partners at economic development, uh, it was determined that REBA should be able uh, to sustain at least for the short term uh, this additional reduction. Moving on to the attached agencies, uh, I'm going to address those attached agencies for which DCA uh, maintains some level of management responsibility. There are other attached agencies such as GFA, for which uh, DCA is simply a pass-through, and I assume you'll hear directly from uh, those agency heads in a separate budget hearing. Uh, number one, under the Commission on the Holocaust uh, budget, that is being reduced by $13,369, and that amounts to 4% of FY20 funding. Uh, number two, uh, we propose a $3,675,000 reduction for the One Georgia Authority, uh, which resets the authority budget to FY18 uh, to its FY18 level. Uh, at that time, both economic development uh, and uh, which is responsible for making recommendations in the EDGE program um, and DCA, which accepts uh, applications for and makes recommendations through the equity program, were both experiencing an uptick in demand. Uh, and some of these, uh, however, some of these additional funds uh, have been used for special projects. And with this reduction, we aim to eliminate the special projects to preserve the flexibility and capacity of One Georgia. 
so I'll now move on to page 114 uh, and our FY21 recommendations, uh, trying not to uh, repeat myself. Um, so, so starting under the building construction budget, uh, we're going to recommend the uh, industrialized building program uh, be moved to the Department of Insurance. Um, the industrialized building program, which does complement construction codes at DCA, um, will be moved to align it with manufactured um, building inspections. Um, the IB program is funded through fees or other uh, funds, uh, and the $232,353 in other funds, uh, which is projected for FY21, would be transferred to the Department of Insurance Fire Safety Program, and that's reflected on page 224 in the, your document. Under coordinated planning, I've already mentioned the regional commission uh, reduction. I've already mentioned the performance audit reduction. The third item here is a $175,000 transfer of the contract for the Keep Georgia Beautiful program from the DCA budget to the Solid Waste Trust Fund at DNR. Uh, this is simply a funds transfer as the valuable program will continue to operate in its current form. Uh, this is important as it relates to the BRACE program. Uh, Keep Georgia Beautiful leverages a significant amount of local resources, uh, volunteer time, money, and other resources to address uh, issues related to litter, uh, beautification, and elimination of blight. Now, we've discussed uh, with Keep Georgia Beautiful the BRACE program's intent, um, and they understand that, and will aim to help leverage their 73 affiliates across the state to tackle the important issue, uh, underlying issue. Under departmental administration, and hopefully I'm moving quickly enough, but not too quickly. Um, so under departmental administration, the first two items are simply enterprise adjustments. I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. Uh, the third item is that non-binding language disregard related to the Commission on the Holocaust. The fourth item is simply the full year savings of $224,902 related to the Georgia Advocacy Office, which I mentioned earlier. Moving to federal community and economic development. Um, the first item uh, it represents a small allocation related to raises for state employees who make less than $40,000. Now I should note uh, that this does not insinuate uh, that DCA is comprised of highly paid employees, uh, much to the contrary. In fact, um, much of our funding comes from federal sources and is not reflected in the state budget. Um, I've asked my team, and we have uh, identified uh, 90 employees who meet the definition, and we are working, my executive team, diligently on a plan to address the underlying um, intent and objective uh, of that, uh, of that uh, recommendation. The second item relates to the Appalachian Regional Commission, which I already mentioned. Uh, the third item is a, um, is a savings of $481,788. Uh, in FY21 through the elimination of an AmeriCorps program in Albany Doherty County. Uh, I recall that this program began as a two-year initiative in 2018. However, the funding was not moved to DCA until FY20. Uh, since August, this program has placed 27 AmeriCorps members in the Doherty County school system to serve as math core tutors for grades four through eight. Uh, beyond that, I don't have a lot of, um, of performance data or additional data to share with you uh, at this time, uh, but that's the, the background on that, um, on that saving. Under regional services, uh, earlier I mentioned the purchase of vehicles to reduce our mileage reimbursement. We're working on the details to affect that recommendation, um, but we anticipate a savings of $63,838 in the FY21 budget. Um, I've already mentioned the elimination of the vacancy in research and surveys. Similarly, under special housing initiatives, we've, uh, we've discussed silk. So I'll move on to state community development. Uh, and we have a number of recommendations under this program budget. Uh, first, uh, currently, uh, the DCA Office of Downtown Development operates a design studio in Athens. And this is a resource that is used uh, by many of our Main Street communities, uh, particularly rural communities that cannot afford the robust resources that are available through UGA. Um, after all, this program is somewhat subsidized. In eliminating this program, we aim to preserve the knowledge and the expertise 
of the small staff. However, we will anticipate $163,798 in savings by eliminating our lease in Athens, uh, our contract with UGA for interns and equipment, uh, and also one full-time position that is currently uh, filled. Number two, I've already mentioned the BRACE program, uh, as well as Keep Georgia Beautiful and some of the conversations we've had there. Uh, line item number three, uh, we're anticipating $2 million in FY21 savings by eliminating the funding that was included in FY20 to initiate the mapping program for the Georgia Broadband Deployment Initiative. Uh, the baseline map, which these funds provided for, uh, will be completed no later than June 30th. Uh, the funds were also intended to provide uh, for the administration of a grant program, which is yet to be funded. Um, now, important to note, DCA will continue to work closely with federal partners and with our providers uh, to pursue any and all available resources to address this important rural priority. Um, I've already mentioned the savings through the pass-through uh, to the Cobb County Support Center. Uh, similarly, uh, numbers five, six, and seven reflect $25,000 in savings um, from funds that were um, passed through to Clayton County Food Pantry, Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, and the Overcomers House. And finally, under this budget line item, uh, you see a, an addition of $1,027,936 related to the move of the Historic Preservation Program, which includes Historic Preservation Tax Credits, um, from the Department of Natural Resources to DCA. Um, Commissioner Williams and I have had ongoing discussions uh, between the agencies and with OPB, and it's determined that this would allow for a more efficient operation, particularly given DCA's uh, experiencing, experience managing other tax credit programs, as well as our commitment to rural downtown development. Um, many historic downtowns and rural communities uh, leverage both DCA resources as well as the historic preservation program. So this move should improve our ability to serve those communities. Um, in terms of resources, uh, this, uh, this will, uh, rep it will involve 18 full-time equivalents, uh, and it also includes some federal funding. Uh, in terms of the state funds, you'll find the corresponding savings in the DNR budget on page 255, where you'll note there's $1,389,137 in budget reductions. Um, again, Commissioner Williams and I are still working through the details, but this should represent a net savings in excess of $361,000 to the state. I'm getting to the end, folks, I promise. Um, so so um, under state economic development, I've already mentioned the elimination of the part-time uh, vacancy. Um, line item number two, uh, in FY20, we received one-time pass-through funding um, as a uh, of four hundred thousand dollars as a match for local funds for the Savannah Logistics Technology Corridor. Uh, this amount is simply eliminated, uh, proposed to be eliminated in the FY21 budget. I already mentioned the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame as well as Reba, which again I will um, I will tell you we uh, we believe should be sustainable in the short term uh, based on our current projections. Finally, under the attached agencies. Um, after discussion with OPB, who highlighted the duplication between the Commission on the Holocaust and KSU, or Kennesaw State University's Museum of History and Holocaust Education, uh, we recommend that the Commission on Holocaust uh, be transferred to the Board of Regents um, and the university system to realize synergies that exist between the two entities. Uh, DCA's involvement with this attached agency is simply to provide back office services and support such as HR, IT, and accounting. Um, I can tell you that there are three FTEs who would be need to be consolidated into KSU. I can't speak in detail to Executive Director Sally Levine's plan for integration. I will highlight simply two things. Um, first, you will note the transfer of uh, in excess of 287,000 in funds to the university system. That includes $20,000 in private foundation funding. Second, you will note an anticipated savings of roughly $65,000 from synergies associated with this consolidation, and some of that may come from the economies of scale in the back office. Finally, uh, you'll note the continuation of our uh, proposed uh, reduction 
in the One Georgia program is reflected in our FY21 budget. Um, I'll let Kevin Clark at GFA and uh, Chris Tomlinson at CERTA address the recommendations affecting uh, those agencies that are administratively attached. Um, so with that, Mr. Chairman, I will take a breath, pause, and entertain any questions. I would be remiss, however, uh, not to uh, end by saying thank you for the legislature's continued support for the great work that we do at DCA, enabling us to help deliver on our mission to help build strong, vibrant communities. So thank you. Do you need oxygen? I do. I do. <laughs> Thank you. I told right. you I'd go quick. <laughs> First question, Representative Stovall. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question about, um, you mentioned something briefly about Clayton County, and I saw they, there was a line item about the food pantry, then you mentioned it again a little later, but you went kind of fast. I wasn't, wasn't able to understand what you were saying. I, and I'm, I apologize for moving fast. I, when I, when I went through this, I realized I had about 45 minutes of material and I wanted to rely, uh, allow questions. Um, th I believe that that is uh, simply a reduction in the FY21 budget of $25,000 in pass-through funds that were included in last year's budget. Um, so it's an FY21 reduction for, uh, for, those, for those funds. Okay, and what was the last part you mentioned about Clayson County Food Pantry? Uh, that that was that was it. Uh, it was the 21 reduction under the state community development budget. Uh, let me point you to the page. Um, it should be page. Um, if you look at the bottom of page 115, 115, mm -hmm. uh, number five, uh, eliminate one-time funds for the Clayton County Food Pantry. Okay. Well, why were those funds eliminated? Um, if you, if you note from taking a quick look at my budget, uh, we didn't leave much that was untouched. Um, so that's just, it was recommended because of the one-time nature of those funding. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair Lady Houston. Uh, two, two quick questions. Uh, what was the thought, thought process about eliminating the audits of the regional commissions? Right. Uh, I, I, I don't understand because we got such good information when we had those audits and, and before then we had no really oversight. Absolutely, uh, and, and Representative Houston, you know that those have been a very valuable tool. Um, and so the, the, the thought process there in the recommendation was simply the transfer of funds from one state agency to another. We, we would certainly be um, open to continuing the performance audit. I'm not aware that there are other agencies that pay for that performance audit, and so that was the uh, that was. The, the, would you have auditors that can perform this? DCA does not. Uh, uh -huh. the Department you would of have audits, to contract that. Out. That's right. Uh -huh. So we just happen to be contracting with our own staff. Yeah. Th that's correct. So it's okay. exactly right. Yeah. This is. That is not a reflection. This is a reflection on fiscal prudence, not on the um, the importance of the performance audit. Well, we were very perform were very uh, helpful to us, and and the audits were done real well. They were, and we would agree with that. Thank you. And the next question, when uh, you talk with, uh, I, I don't know who you talk with about combining the Holocaust commission over at Kennesaw. Did y'all take into effect everything that's been done in Sandy Springs with the Anne Frank exhibit and all the people, it's the only one this side of Amsterdam and all of this when y'all were doing right, that? It's, it's fantastic, it really is. What, did um, y'all discuss this when you were? So, so uh, I, I think that that was all taken into consideration as you looked at some of the challenges uh, with, um, you know, with, with managing that program and with the administrative overhead. Um, but yes, and that's, that's something that I think uh, the devil's in the details of how we um, consolidate those and, uh, and maintain the well, great well, work that they Well, isn't this thing done. in Sandy Springs, I don't think that's sort of a completely separate sort of idea than what you've got over at Kennesaw. Right, right. So. Uh, I think that's a fair point. Yeah. So do you think the people in Sandy Springs are going to be miserable to having this put over there? I can't speak to whether someone else is going to be miserable. Yeah, because uh, we've got a lot of people coming in from all over the on Monday to, to see this, and and right. uh, it's quite a quite a feather in Georgia's cap to have it there. Appreciate the comments. So. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lucas. Uh, there's one 
about that is is the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame, a State Hall of Fame, or a local Hall of Fame? I, I'm sorry. Uh, I say please. is the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame, a State Hall of Fame, or a local Hall of Fame? My understanding is that that's a State Hall of Fame. Uh, this was simply a pass-through that was included in our budget, which the governor uh, included in his line item disregard. So we would simply pass those funds through. I, I don't have a lot of direct knowledge about the, um, the, the uh, governance structure of the Georgia yeah. Sports Hall of Fame. Well, the governor vetoed the bill that allowed the money to go. That, that, that's one thing. That's correct. Now, let me ask you another. On the Appalachian grant, uh, we got more for Elbert County for $400,000. That's right. I worked the, hard for that, uh, Senator. Uh, but now you tell me you're gonna cut the money to for the assessment of right. the Appalachian. Now we get money, but we cut the folks who do the work. Yeah, I I greatly appreciate you asking the question so that I can uh, put an exclamation point on the fact that we are proposing no cuts to the Appalachian Regional Commission. And you're correct, we've just funded a fantastic project in Elbert County, um, which frankly, I had to spend a lot of time in Washington getting that one through. Um, th that program is a vital program and we aim not to uh, cut the program. We are simply um, shifting those funds. Currently, the assessment is paid for in part through the DCA budget and in part through One Georgia Authority um, uh, direction, um, and we would simply shift that money to the One Georgia Authority. The purposes of ARC and One Georgia uh, are very much in sync, um, so this would have no effect, uh, let me repeat, this would have no effect on our ability to uh, access that $4 million last year in funding. Um, so we're not, we're not doing away with the program, we're simply shifting the funding for that assessment. Does well, that, the, do you understand? Who do you go to? Do you go to the Department of Community Affairs to, to make the application, or you go to one joint? You, you would come to, it's, it's not the, you would continue to do everything exactly the way you do today. Uh, we, DCA, would simply go to the One Georgia Board, um, which we currently do to fund a portion of that assessment, and we would uh, request that the One Georgia Authority Board fund the entirety of that assessment. That assessment this year uh, is approximately $150,000. Uh, you note here that the, uh, the budget, the DCA budget currently includes $130,000. So One Georgia is already funding that, uh, that additional uh, amount. So no change to the program. It does not, no, uh, no local community will have to change the way they apply for that program. This is simply about how we contribute our portion to Washington. We've got time for a couple more questions. I will remind everybody that if you're on the committee, we'll try to get to your questions. However, if you're not on the House or Senate Approach Committee, we just ask that you'd ask one of the other members to ask your question for you in the essence of time. But like we've had to do this morning too, if you've got questions once we have to get to the cutoff time here in a few minutes, just catch the commissioner outside. I'm sure he'll be glad to give you another 15 minutes worth of stuff in about five minutes. Senator Gooch. Commissioner, thank you for what you do. Um, being a former commissioner in Lumpkin County, I've depended a lot on the D DCA for all of your work through the federal grant program and state funds. and. It's very important for local governments to have that access, especially rural areas. We've worked a lot on rural issues over the last three or four years, and you and I have worked well together on the broadband initiative and the $2 million that's being cut. Obviously, there's, there's no easy way to cut budgets when you're in a downside, down cycle. So tell me again, at a, maybe at 70 miles per hour, what, what this impact's gonna be to the department uh, and where we go from here, uh, you still have the executive director in place. What's next on the, on the broadband plans? Thank you for your comments and thanks for the question. Is 70 miles an hour faster or slower than I was going? Much slower. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were at 110, so, I think. So, I, I clocked you at 110 and I'm not a law enforcement. So again, I apologize. Um, so, so thank you for the question. So um, 
Dina Perry, who is the executive director for the Georgia Broadband Deployment Initiative, is, is doing yeoman's work uh, in the area of, of um, rural broadband, um, which is a huge challenge, and many of you have been so helpful in, uh, in, in this area. Um, we have been working closely with the providers and local governments and development authorities uh, as we do exactly as was instructed in Senate Bill 402 uh, two sessions ago, which is to develop the framework for a program. Um, we will continue to work uh, on every angle, including look at, looking at local government bonds and other, uh, other tools uh, to address rural broadband. What the impact of that $2 million will be, uh, as I mentioned, a portion of that uh, was included to help manage a grant program, which has yet to materialize. Um, a portion of that, a substantial portion, was intended to develop a baseline map for the state to identify served and unserved areas. Um, we all, those who have been involved in this conversation, appreciate that the federal government's maps, um, and that's where we're going for resources today, um, are skewed. Uh, they even recognize that and have looked at the work that we are doing. Um, the baseline maps that we will deliver by June 30th of this year um, are already um, beginning to show us what we expected. Um, I would hope that within the next couple of months that we will be able to share some preliminary data, but extrapolating from what I've seen to date, uh, it would appear that you know, tens of thousands of census blocks in the state that the federal government believes are served are actually unserved. You, you could further extrapolate based on our methodology that that relates to hundreds of thousands of locations in the state. Um, so we will have, we will be able to produce that baseline map and using that map, which we are all in this room, I'm sure, eager to, uh, to get our hands on, we will use that to plan and develop our next step. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that, that completes the time that we have for Commissioner Nunn. Commissioner, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate also what you do and um, the, the hours that you spent with, with myself and, and our deceased colleague, Chairman Powell, on our work on the Rural Development Council and all the members there. Just want to say again, thank you for the, for the input that you've had and, and the communication we've had on all of those projects. And uh, we hope and plan to continue moving that ball forward as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, next presenter up will be Commissioner Russell McMurray with Georgia Department of Transportation. And I see him coming in the back door now. Commissioner, we're glad to have you with us. Thank you for being here. And in the interest of everyone's time, uh, the podium is yours. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, it's great to be here today. On behalf of Tim Golden, our State Transportation Board Chair, he sends his regrets. He had a funeral to attend and some other family members. But glad to have our uh, Deputy Commissioner with us, Mike Dover, our Chief Engineer, Meg Perkle, Angela Whitworth up here, and George Christensen from Budge Office, and Josh Waller. So. Uh, we've got a presentation we're going to go through uh, today. My goal is to hit a little bit on transportation funding sources.
purposes and talk about some trans, trends we're seeing in transportation funding. Of course, go over the MENDIT 20 budget, the 21 budget review, and then provide you a few GDOT updates you may find interest in. On the next page, uh, slide three, is a little bit of a history lesson in motor fuel excise. And that's the excise tax of what revenue is generated since 2016. And what I call your attention to is you can see the blue is actual collections and you can see sort of a stair-stepped approach. But as we hit fiscal year 19, 20, and 21, you can see that those stair steps have got smaller and there's not a big a step in between on excise tax. And we'll take a little bit of a uh, deeper dive into that and just highlight something I wanted to make sure you're aware of. The next slide is a little bit of a uh, zigzag, if you will, but this shows the actual gas consumption, so not revenue, but consumption by, you can see, 100 millions of gallons over there for physical year 18, 19, and 20. The blue line is 2018, the green line is 2019, and the red line is 2020. So in 2020, collections to date are tracking below, excuse me, I gotta say that, consumption is tracking below the previous two years. And so that certainly gives a little concern. And I think if you notice, if you go back into the 2018, uh, if you look at that December, you can see that big spike in the green there uh, that happened around December. And that correlates uh, just about closely to Hurricane Michael's devastation that happened in October. But what's interesting is we see that trend continue over those months. And so consumption has been down about two or three percent from the previous year. So, uh, and then the next slide is, that's, that was gas, motor fuel gas. The next slide is diesel. Same colors again, blue's 2018, green is 2019, and red is 2020. And we're, we're passing out uh, handouts so you'll have these and take a deeper look at them later. You can see that red's really tracking very closely uh, to the 2019. Uh, so diesel is tracking pretty much very similar to last year. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Our next slide is the total consumption by physical year. So you can sort of see if you look at the top of that chart again is gasoline. If you look at 2018, we hit an all time high of consumption and 2019 and 2020 have been reduced a little bit. And really the thing I highlight today is between 2019 and 2020, it's remained virtually flat, if you will. Again, you can, if you look at diesel, the bottom chart, diesel has continued to increase pretty linearly uh, year over year with a little bit of a flat area between 2017 and 2018. So as we look at this, you think about gas and diesel of what it means to generate revenue for our budget. There's about 6.5 billion gallons, about 78% of the gallons collected between diesel and gas, or 78% of that is gas out of the total. So uh, gasoline is predominantly the largest share, uh, a lot more so than diesel. So you're saying to yourself, why are we seeing less consumption when we have an all-time unemployment number, low number, and seeing a great economy. And if you feel like you're seeing traffic as busy as ever been, that is true. The next slide is a snapshot that comes from our federal highway partners that show the regions of the United States and how much volume or vehicle miles are traveled every month. So they do a comparison of vehicle miles travel from say uh, January 2020 back to January 2019, and they look at that growth. And you can see how the regions are faring. The South Atlantic region, uh, about 1.1% growth from October of 19, October of 18. This is our most recent data we have. If you look at Georgia's average for 2019, Georgia's vehicle miles travel of how much people travel grew by 1.9%. And so this is beginning to, you know, to us, we're saying this is very interesting, and we wanted to point this out, that consumption's down, but people are driving more. So we're seeing more of that. And probably your first thing goes to, it must be fuel efficiency, right? So fuel efficiency probably has something to play in it, but in fact, the fuel efficiency 
uh, from 2020 back to 2019 actually got a little bit worse because there's more SUVs, bigger fleet vehicles that people are buying and using. So we're seeing that not really make that big a difference. Uh, and then you're saying, well, maybe it's electric vehicles. Georgia is one of the larger states with electric vehicles at about 15,527 according to DOR's records. That's out of 6.24 million cars. So that's an infinitesimal 0.25% of the fleet's electric vehicles. So obviously they're not influencing that. But what we have seen over the last few years is that vehicle miles traveled to how many people's on the road has been growing about four to, I don't know, somewhere between two to 4% per year. And again, this last year still growing by 1.9%, right at 2% but maybe it's slowing down a little bit. So that really sort of makes us baffled a little bit why consumption is going down. Again, diesel consumption is still going up a little bit. Gasoline is definitely flattening out, uh, but people are traveling more. I don't think it's scooters either. We're not counting people riding scooters. So uh, with that, a little bit of a history lesson, that consumption ties directly to revenue, and that's why we're here today to talk about the budget. And if you look at the amended fiscal year 2020, which on the governor's budget report, there's a nice summary table on page 33 and 34. Uh, it shows the reflection in that lower amount of consumption. So in amended 2020, we're reducing the base budget by $14.1 million uh, from 1.925 billion down to 1.911 billion. And that's, again, totally based on seeing less consumption uh, across the board there. So just as a historical note, this is the first time that we've had to reduce the amended budget since fiscal year 14. So it's been quite a while since we've been before you here in the amended budget year saying we need to dampen back down the uh, base estimate. For fiscal year 21, does show a $51.6 million add because we're still showing some growth into 21, about 3.5% growth would, is what that looks like. And so those numbers, the 1.911 for amended fiscal year 20 on the top table and the 1.977 on the bottom table gives us our beginning part, a beginning base to our budget. But that's not the only source of transportation funding that's out there. So on the next slide, I wanted to break down the other sources of funding. As you remember from HB 170 back in 2015, there's fees that go toward transportation funding as well that total $211.4 million. And you can refer to this for amended 20 as well as 2021 because basically OPBs held that, that the same for both years. And that's a good, I think a very good approach. So the major components of the transportation fees and some state general funds are this. The uh, highway impact fees consist of about $15.6 million. Uh, that includes, uh, excuse me, I said that wrong. Hi yeah, no, highway impact fees, about 15.6. Hotel, motel fees, about 179.3 million, and then state general funds, about 16.4. And out of the state general funds to transportation, the bulk of that, about 14 million, goes to the aviation program, and I'll talk about that in detail a little bit later. And then the balance goes over to the ATL for the Atlanta uh, Transit Link Authority. So when we look at these numbers, I'll just break down the highway impact fees because I mentioned the electric vehicle fees. About 25% of that highway impact fee is electric vehicle. The vast majority is at the heavy uh, vehicle impact fee that is assessed there. So that's sort of, again, here's the sources of use of, of other transportation funds. And on the next page, page 10, here's how where they're used. So you take the $211.4 million. Uh, you just heard from Christopher Nunn, about 15.29 goes to the DCA, which under them has the Georgia Regional Transportation Authority at 12.8 million. And then 2.47, again, going over to the Atlanta Transportation link uh, authority. So uh, you can see a pretty good breakdown on the governor's uh, budget report on page 33. It sort of shows where those go. And the DCA budget can be found over on page 111 if you're interested in looking at that. So that's amended FY20. Let me transition into fiscal year 21. Again, we held the 
$211.4 million, the same as amended fiscal year 20. And then here's the breakdown of where the other funds are being utilized for transportation purposes. In Greta, you can see a big difference in Greta at $330,000. Uh, in an increase to the ATL, uh, that net difference is only about 3.4 million from amended 20 to 21. And the big difference there, and Chris Tomlinson will talk to you, talk to the subcommittees later, about moving in the express service into the ATL as HB 930 uh, required that to happen. Also, you can see uh, Department of Public Safety at 15.8 million that goes to the Motor Carrier Compliance Div Division. And that leaves to the GDOT budget about $176.8 million uh, for transportation purposes. So with that being said, let me move into the actual amended FY20 budget. It's page 356 in the governor's budget. And this chart, we, we always like to use this chart because it summarizes a couple of budget pages onto one page. And this represents the state budget totaling $2.1 billion for amended FY20. And by breakdown, and this is, this is a good way to see where the dollars are going. So under the left bar chart at $1.005 billion is capital projects. That consists of capital construction budget on your sheet, capital maintenance budget on your sheet, and local roads administration budget. So that is the money that's going to build projects, either buy property or build projects. The next column is general operations. And this consists of five budget programs on your sheet. Uh, that's our overall administration, what's called construction administration, all the work it takes to develop projects to bid them out. That's what construction administration is. Data collections, that's a lot of federal requirements that we have to report, also generating county maps. Planning division and also traffic management. So the, the uh, programs such as keeping up with traffic signals, stopping the roads, doing all the safety kind of things, fall under traffic management. That constitutes about 10.5% of our budget. LMIG, the local maintenance improvement grant program, is appropriated there at 10%. And I just continue to highlight that even, even with a little bit uh, slowing consumption, uh, since 2015, the LMIG program has seen a 58.3% increase. And I think each of your cities and counties are very appreciative of that. And I might highlight this year too, we did all electronic LMIG applications, which sped up the process even more. So I hope you hear in positive things from your cities and counties. The next budget category on this chart is in the middle there, routine maintenance at 443 million, represents about 21% of our budget. And a matter of fact, out of that routine maintenance, about half of that is now outsourced. And I'll highlight that a little later in the presentation. Uh, so if you add up the capital projects, the LMIG, and the routine maintenance, that's about 79% of our budget going to actual infra direct infrastructure investment, which I think is a good story to tell. And then if the next category to the right is the payments to CERTA at 5%, payments to CERTA consist of three major buckets, basically paying for bonds, previous bond debt that we have. And then there's the GTIB, the Georgia Transportation Infrastructure Bank that's funded at $12.9 million. And then also funding CERTA operations, their toll operations until these projects get developed that we're working on at $10 million. So the total is 103 million, all but about 23 million of that's going to pay previous debt, either what's called Garvey, which are federal debt paybacks or guaranteed revenue bonds payback. And then the next to right, the next to the last column on the right is our intermodal program at $19.8 million. Uh, the breakdown on that, again, is about 14.6 to the aviation program, 3.2 to the transit program, about 1.2 million to our ports program where we work with the Georgia Ports Authority, and last is about $734,000 to administer the state-owned rail program. So that's a good breakdown and overview of sort of where these dollars are being spent. Now to the changes on amended fiscal year 20. Uh, again, these are on the governor's tracking document on 356 and page 357. And so as we take the reflection of a reduction of 14.16 million in motor fuel, 
That's going to come from the following three places, or really two places. One is $11.3 million in the capital construction program. So that, again, that's capital construction is building projects, either buying property or building them themselves. The LMIG, pro, the LMIG is adjusted such that 10% maxes the, matches the excise amount. So LMIG, again, is based on 10% of whatever the excise amount is. So that is a correction to that number. And then in payments to CERTA in the top, top chart, in payments to CERTA in the bottom chart is just a fund source swap from motor fuel to transportation fees. So those sort of net out. So those are the major changes to amended fiscal year 20 uh, request. And then I'll move into the FY20 budget request, governor's recommendation. Totals $2.154 million, billion dollars, sorry, $2.154 billion. Um, the LMIG, let me again just highlight the same, same things. The program on capital projects from 20, 20 goes from 47 to 49 percent capital projects. The general appropriation stayed the same at 10 and a half percent. LMIG stayed the same at 10 percent. Routine maintenance went from 21 percent in 20 down to 20.5 percent, so just a small, small uh, difference in percentage. Uh, CERTA reduced to from 5 percent to 4 percent. Intermodal stayed the same at 1 percent and general obligation uh, debt stayed the same. And so let me just highlight again, uh, the difference here is uh, in LMIG, again, it, ma it matches up exactly to the excise. And uh, geo debt, by the way, won't show up in your tracking document. It's not, it's not shown reflective. It's not reflected right in our section, I don't believe. So let me move into this next table, which summarizes the changes to the fiscal year 21 budget request. So we're adding 51.6 million in motor fuel. The largest line share of that is 36.9 back to the capital construction pro program, 6.8 million add to capital maintenance. Think of capital maintenance as resurfacing, bridge rehabilitation, uh, those kind of things. Again, an adjustment for LMIG at 5.1 million to 197. Um, and then payments to CERTA, uh, we have $2.6 million add there, and I'll go over that in a minute. Uh, down on the bottom part of that table is the change in motor fuel, uh, excuse me, the change in fees and state general funds. So the bond debt reduced, which is always a good sign, that's a good positive sign, and you see a $6.8 million reduction in bond debt. And then you can see, again, a payment to CERTA, uh, a, $11.49 million reduction, which is predominantly reduction in debt to guaranteed revenue bonds and Garvey bonds as well. So that debt service is coming down, which is very good. Uh, in payments to CERTA, there are still $10 million for toll operations. There's also the 12.99 for the Georgia Transportation Infrastructure Bank, and also an add of about $2.5 million to help pre-fund some of the debt that CERTA has on the I-75 South Express Lane project to help pay, we're gonna to try to pay that bond down early uh, to save the state money in the long run. Uh, also on the intermodal, you can see a $500,000 add there, and that is to, uh, for us to contract with DNR to help fund the Sapelo Island Ferry that runs back and forth. Even though the Commissioner Williams has tried to give me the ferry, I think he is certainly suitable and adequate to always run that ferry. Of course, the coast might sound pretty good on a day like today, as cold as it is. So that's the, uh, that's the FY21 budget. Uh, let me move into just a few updates of things you may find of interest in. Uh, also in the proposal uh, this year is 50 million for bridge bonds. I know that this body remembers uh, that we have been making, the state's been making significant investment in bonds for state bridges, which helps us free up dollars to work on local bridges of which we have need. I always like to show this map. I know it's a little bit hard to see. Georgia ranks very good in our bridge condition at less than 3% of what's called deficient bridges. And we rank very well nationally as we compete against states, but the reality is there's still 1,551 bridges, usually county roads or city street bridges, that need some form of replacement, major replacement, uh, not rehabilitation, but replacement. And so uh, we have to keep that eye on the prize, and again, 
We take the bond dollars and work on state assets, being state routes and interstates, freeze up what we normally program for bridges, which again, we go right to local, local uh, roads uh, and try to help replace those and help the counties. So one interesting fact toward while I'm talking about bridges from the Freight Commission, and I hate to, hate to digress a little bit, is we looked at what it would cost to put one bridge overpass over each of our class one railroads, being North Fort Southern and CSX, in every city in Georgia. Just add one bridge over the railroad. Forget whether they have a bridge or not there now. It would cost $4 billion, $4 billion, to give every city one bridge over the railroad. Pretty staggering when you start thinking about it. So bridges obviously are big dollar items and we're very excited to have this 50 million uh, in the budget uh, or for bonds uh, presented. One of the success stories I want to share with you too is again, I mentioned the maintenance that we outsource about half of our maintenance. Uh, we have more maintenance to do than the men and women of GDOT can keep up with, so we're very excited that we're able to outsource and help them be able to accomplish their mission. So this is one form of what we call invitations to bid or ITBs of where we partnered with DOAS such that you have an online process for companies, small companies, that can register and become a approved contractor with Georgia DOT and actually sign a contract that they become an on-call contractor with us. And then each of our districts, when they have maintenance work to be done, simply send out a electronic invitation bid to bid to the email that the company has set up that they want their correspondence to go to. And so they're able to then submit their bid back electronically and then we're able to accept the lowest bid. They're already under contract with us, so usually there's a small bond, uh, maybe a bond requirement, and we try to scale those. And then they're off to work very quickly. And so this has been a, a tremendous, important uh, thing that we've put in place that shows a lot of work, and you see this work as you go up and down the, the highways and byways of Georgia. But what's really neat is when we get to this next slide, out of that last slide, you could see that there was about $114 million totally for these type of projects. 49 million of that went to small business, or 43% went to small business. In fact, we have 289 vendors in the system, and about 54% of those are small business. So I think this is a great testament of a way to do things innovatively, quickly, efficiently, and engage small business because a lot of these things, again, you don't have to have a big operation. Uh, you can get out there with what you have and, and help us accomplish our mission. So again, 54% are getting 43% of the work. That's pretty good. Uh, so I'm really proud of that. While I stand before this Joint Appropriations Committee, I always feel like it's important to keep just a little bit of a focus on what's going on federally. When we stood here last year, things weren't so good federally. We were in shutdowns and continuing resolutions. The full year's appropriations for FY20 has been passed by Congress for transportation funding, so we're in good shape there. But we've got to keep our eyes on the prize because at October 1, the current transportation funding bill is set to expire. A positive note is the Senate Environmental and Public Works Committee has always already put down a marker, a, a bill, if you will, a proposal uh, that we're watching that has a little bit of an increase in uh, transportation investment, but it added some other programs too. So we'll just keep an eye on that, but I wanted to keep that in front of you that this year is very big, and on this slide you can sort of see the history of federal transportation funding, which usually go into five or ten, you know, five-year increments or so. So we'll be watching this closely as the year develops. Finally, I'd like to conclude on probably the most important thing at Georgia DOT, and that's our people. The men and women of GDOT I can't say enough about. Many of you have experienced them working in hurricanes, snow and ice, floods. When, whenever those kind of things, disasters happen, I'm always impressed about how our men and women show up and they focus on how they can do things better. Uh, I just wanted to show you this chart. Uh, we're, Right now, we're hovering right about 3,958 employees. You can see the trend. And I really wanted to highlight since 2016, we're delivering over a billion dollars more a year with either the fewer people than we had when we started that year. And so that takes a lot of work. Our turnover rate right now is about 16%. So that turns into last year, 628 people separated from the department. 
that's a lot of HR work, 628 people in a year to hire back, and, and we hired, actually hired back 651, so keeping a little bit ahead above water. But I just highlight that because it's not the work I do, it's the work of the men and women of GDOT that find ways to innovate, find ways to be effective, and to deliver. According to a U.S. government spending website, I have to quote that, it's not mine, U.S. government spending website, Georgia has the 13th lowest per capita transportation spending in the nation. I think that shows that we provide value. So I'm really proud of what they do. Uh, Chairman, I'll be glad to entertain any questions or comments. Well, you just about talked yourself out of time, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I was quick. You were. You just had a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, so that means we're only, truly only going to have time for just a couple of questions. And um, Chair Lady Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple comments. Um, one, thank you to the department for the help we received last year in South Georgia during the hurricane. It made a tremendous difference. And the cooperation we're seeing from the department to help us even today is still exceptional. Okay. In, in looking at going forward, the dollars that we have, do we anticipate an increase in the revenue that comes in from our uh, gasoline? Or I, I really don't think we have a good enough picture to find out why it's being reduced. Yeah, so again, we, I sort of gave you the how many licks in the Tootsie Pop you know, question. We're not sure. I just wanted to bring this to everybody's attention that we've got to continue to watch it. You know, obviously budget conservatively so that we're in the right spot, and I think that's been done. Uh, I just think we need to continue to watch that because it is a little baffling as more people driving and the uh, consumption is going down. So we're just going to have to watch that and see how that trend sta stays. Diesel looks like it's trending in the right direction. And I think we'll start seeing, especially in spring, as people start spring, spring break and travel for the summer, seeing if we see that upward trajectory come back. It's something that we'll have to continue to monitor. Thank you. Okay, Vice Chairman Tiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for what you do for our state. My question really dovetails on uh, Chair Lady Taylor's. If I'm, it's laid out best on page eight of, uh, of your, your sheets, although it's in our book several times. If we're expecting motor fuel to go down roughly 14 million in this amended budget, how can we expect it will be back up 60 for 2021? And, and I know. If, if you don't have an answer, how do, how do we get to that projection? That's, what, that's my question. Yeah, I, I don't have that answer. I mean, continuing to look at those trends and trying to see if it continues to trend back up, uh, I think is what we have to do. And again, probably spring is a better indicator than, you know, November, October, December, November. Uh, that federal highway statistic chart I showed you of the nation, too, only is October. So we're going to be watching as those sort of looking at that correlation, again, of vehicle miles travel based on consumption and uh, you know it's not a direct correlation but there's certainly a correlation consumption to revenue last question we're going to have time for in this segment senator gooch all right thank you commissioner i had one quick question uh, reflecting back on the investment act of 2015 which was probably one of the most significant pieces of legislation that we've ever passed in this body you all agree with that indexing what would this position look like the the graphs that you have today what would it look like without the indexing because it looks like it'd be a lot worse picture than what we have today uh, senator that's a that's a great uh, observation and without the indexing, then it would have been declining our revenues would certainly been declining obviously we're keeping pace with inflation and again, on the CAFE standards of fuel efficiency. So that, that is keeping us ahead of where we definitely would have been. The, the numbers of that, I don't know what that would actually equate to. But You don't have it. You, the, didn't, you didn't calculate that. No, I have not. But okay. we, can tra we can get that for you. Good to know. Okay, Commissioner. I'm, you know, I love numbers. And on your graph in the United States, you're showing total vehicle miles in October of 2019 nationwide, 285.1 billion miles. Just for those of you that are numbers nerds like me, at an average of 50,000 miles per set of tires for one year, that would be 68,424,000 sets of tires or individually 273,696 tires 
million, excuse me, 273,000, 273 million, 696,000 tires. But anyway, we appreciate you being here. And that's just a fascinating number. I had no idea. Yeah, it's easy for me to say. And I've been wondering why there were tire stores on every corner. Now I understand now why. Now you know why. <laughs> <laughs> thank so, you, Chairman. Thank you all. Thank you both. All right, next up is Commissioner Spencer Moore of Department of Driver Services. Commissioner Moore, thank you for being with us this afternoon, and the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to come up and give you some discussion about the DDS budget. Um, we're much smaller than, than Commissioner Russell's uh, shop, so uh, uh, we, we don't have a large PowerPoint to go by, but we certainly, uh, I'd like to start with where he ended, which is the department uh, has exceptional staff, uh, and that's the reason why uh, our agency continues to serve uh, the constituents that come into our office uh, efficiently. Uh, and I'd like to start with just a little bit of that. Our goal at DDS is, is to serve 95% of our customers in 30 minutes or less. I'm happy to say that we've achieved that the last four consecutive years. So from the time you receive a ticket, to the time that you get to uh, a counter uh, it, with one of our employees, uh, we have been able to not only exceed that 95% of our customers uh, served in 30 minutes or less. The last two years, we've done that in less than 10 minutes. Uh, hopefully, uh, you, you, along with your constituents, have seen uh, a vast improvement in the way that we serve customers at the Department of Driver Services. Uh, and as a way of background, I'd like to say this. We have more than 8.177 million licensed drivers in our state. Uh, so obviously, uh, we have a number of people who have licenses and are on the roads. If many of you have traveled recently, you might notice uh, when you got to the airport, I uh, noticed that effective October 1st of 2020, uh, if you don't have a real ID credential, you won't be able to board a plane. I'm also happy to say that Georgia is 90 eight percent compliant uh, with the real ID uh, law uh, that exceeds the entire country uh, as a nation uh, more than 71 percent of the nation is not real ID compliant so it's uh, really uh, exciting that we have achieved the goal uh, of, of getting to a position where we can get our customers served uh, in that amount of time uh, in that time frame I'd like to start with what I think is on uh, the governor's recommendation on page 154. Uh, there are three programs at the Department of Driver Services. Uh, our departmental administration program, which is more or less our support group uh, for our licensing uh, administration uh, program, uh, which is our license issuance process, the ability uh, to issue a driver's license. And then, of course, we have a re regulatory compliant uh, regulatory uh, component, and I'll speak to that. But <clears throat> on page 154, you'll notice uh, that, of course, the enterprise changes for our agency is reflected there uh, in an ad of $5,349, uh, and then there is a reduction uh, in funds by freezing vacant positions. Uh, and we are happy to say these are indeed vacant positions. Uh, so uh, the impact to the department and our ability to achieve our, our mission and goal is not impacted by uh, this reduction of funds. Uh, that $126,814. Likewise, on line three, the leverage we have uh, 
uh, you show a reduction of $11,525. Uh, that is a, also uh, a reduction that uh, the department will um, continue to utilize Skype distance learning uh, opportunities. We have 67 locations around the state, uh, but all employees come to Conyers, uh, which is our headquarters and where we provide uh, training for anyone who enters the department. Uh, but what we have found is that we can use distance learning opportunities uh, to reduce our budget by this amount, $11,525 in the departmental administration program uh, to achieve uh, the reductions required uh, to meet the governor's recommendation. On line four, you'll notice the reduction of funds for operating expenses and telecommunications uh, in this particular program. That is the reduction of phone lines, computer, uh, computer devices, cell phones, et cetera. Uh, in this program alone, we were able to uh, essentially cut off 11 cell phones, uh, five computers were disconnected, 13 landlines, uh, and we were able to save, <clears throat> and we are able to save uh, roughly $12,000 uh, by cutting our, our, our simple costs, supply costs, paper, toner, uh, printed materials, those things that it takes to operate the, the department. Uh, under the next program, which is our license issuance, this is our largest program at the Department of Driver Services. Uh, and this is where uh, if you go into a center uh, where in each of the 67 locations you'll find an examiner uh, that is there to hopefully greet you uh, and help you receive your service. Uh, so this makes up the vast uh, majority of our uh, agency. Uh, we also have uh, in that particular uh, program uh, a number of investigators, um, our, our um, program management office, uh, as well as some additional uh, responsibilities in our IT and facilities. Uh, so in this particular line item, if you will notice on, again on page 154, the governor, governor's recommendation, uh, an enterprise ad of that $33,287 um, for the agency premiums. Uh, and what you will see is a reduction of $527,000 uh, in line item two under license issuance. And that is a reduction uh, by not uh, moving forward with um, appropriations that we got this past last uh, session. Uh, so essentially we, we felt like uh, one of the uh, best ways that we can achieve our goal is to not implement uh, 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 some of the recommendations or appropriations that were passed uh, last session. Uh, these particular, this particular uh, goal was uh, to, to put a vault program uh, in uh, our 27 busiest centers uh, where we collect $10,000 or more. Uh, one of the vulnerabilities that our staff has uh, is uh, we obviously are a place where we collect a lot of uh, funds, uh, especially in our large uh, locations. Uh, so our, in many of those places, our staff actually have to make bank drops. Uh, so if you can imagine there's some danger in uh, taking that type of cash uh, to a, a local bank uh, in order to, to make that drop. So while we weren't able uh, to implement the vault program and a security guard program that we intended to do with this, this reduction, uh, we, we are able to implement camera systems in many of those locations to assist us uh, with the ability to provide uh, security and, and safety for our staff. Uh, on line three, uh, this is the largest reduction in this, um, this program, and that is to reduce funds by freezing vacant positions, uh, $1,374,927. Uh, this is uh, also indeed uh, a true vacancies, uh, people who are not uh, at the agency uh, and in uh, positions that uh, we, can, we don't need in order to meet our service level. And reasons why uh, at this particular moment that we don't need them uh, is a couple reasons. I mentioned that we're 98% compliant with Real ID. That means that for the majority of persons who come uh, and get a service, they are now able to do that service once they're Real ID compliant uh, from their phone from their home computer, uh, wherever they desire to do that transaction because 
Uh, once you're Real ID compliant, you have proved yourself uh, with us in that online capability of doing a transaction uh, with the agency um, is acceptable. And we have had up to 3.5 million people that we served uh, last year face to face. There were an additional 833,000 uh, that we served in an online uh, or a mobile app format. So those were 833,000 people that didn't come into a center to get a service because we were able to serve them uh, in that capacity. As we continue to get Real ID compliant, the more people we expect to uh, utilize online services uh, versus having to come into a center uh, and engage one of our employees. Uh, thus, this gives us the ability to make uh, this, this budget reduction. Uh, on line item four, uh, you will also see the reduction of operating expenses for tele telecommunications and, and technology. Uh, this is our effort um, to modernize. Uh, most of you, uh, at the point that you're going to uh, it's time to renew your license. You get a little blue postcard from our agency saying it's time to renew. Uh, at this particular moment, we have more than 3 million um, emails. So versus you getting uh, those postcards, blue postcards, we will now be sending uh, emails uh, to customers uh, letting them know that it's time to renew. Uh, so we think that this is an innovative change and will help uh, us uh, in, in uh, achieve the goal uh, that is, um, uh, has been presented in the way of budget reduction. Likewise, in this particular effort, uh, one item to note is we print a lot of manuals. Uh, if you're a young driver uh, seeking to get a driver's uh, license, uh, you most time come uh, to our office a few months in advance and pick up uh, a manual in our office that's printed and provided to the public. It has been for a long time. It's, it's a very uh, nice uh, publication now, but we also offer that publication online. Uh, so what we would, we would uh, like to do is defer cost and have uh, those young drivers uh, download our materials online versus actually having uh, to come in and physically get that document. Uh, that line item alone, uh, if we can stop printing those manuals, uh, at least 80% uh, reduction in those printing uh, is roughly $188,000. So this is how we achieve uh, that particular reduction that is noted on line item four. Line item five is also a $50,000 $50, reduction that we were able to achieve uh, in the improvement of our lobby management function. Uh, one of the um, really important ways that we serve cus customers efficiently uh, is our lobby management process, the ability to come in, we know who got there, uh, you're, in, you're in a line, you're in a queue, uh, and we can call you up systematically. Uh, we were able to change that technology last year, uh, which gave us a re uh, savings of roughly $50,000. Uh, on line item six, this is an additional uh, request for funds uh, to implement our drives project. This is a project uh, that we have worked cooperatively with uh, the Department of Revenue uh, in order to uh, finally put uh, the, the vehicle um, uh, tag information uh, in the same system with the driver's license information. Um, as you might know, this is a very, very important function uh, for our state. Uh, we are in phase two of that project. Um, the Department of Revenue successfully uh, implemented their, po their portion of the project um, last May. We kicked off the project at DDS uh, in October. Uh, and we are currently in a status health uh, from our independent validation and verification uh, company of Green. So we are moving forward uh, with that technology. Our need, however, is to provide additional dollars for data migration. That is getting the legacy information that we have in our systems over to the new system that we will get with the Drives project. So that is the re uh, reason for the request of the $469,000. Uh, and then if certainly uh, in the amended budget, we are hoping um, to uh, take advantage, uh, or not necessarily take advantage, but improve our situation as it relates to our fleet. Uh, we have 144 vehicles in our D DDS fleet. Um, four of them, uh, of those, uh, those vehicles, are current, currently awaiting uh, surplus uh, due to uh, mechanical failures. 
12 exceed 135,000 surplus mileage, uh, and 29% of our fleet uh, is 10 years of age or older. Commissioner, let me, let me, we've got about three minutes left. Okay. All right. So, and and the, the great part of these changes uh, is they go forward in 2021. So everything that I'm explaining applies for the budget in 2021 with the exception of one item, and I will sp specifically mention that one. Uh, to, to move uh, the Regulatory Compliance Division, which is our last vision along, uh, uh, forward, uh, the changes that we're reflecting here, again, enterprise changes are noted. Uh, and then, of course, the freezing of positions, that $96,216. Uh, and the same leveraging of technology that I spoke of in the, in the other two programs are the same ways in which we will reach uh, the reductions that are proposed. Uh, as I quickly go into fish, uh, federal fiscal year, excuse me, amended or state fiscal year, I used to work in, in federal programs a lot, so um, excuse the reference, but into uh, fiscal year 2021, the additional change that is reflected uh, beyond the fact that we are now uh, um, utilizing nine month changes and putting in, them into 12, 12 month uh, reductions uh, is uh, our effort uh, in the license issuance program uh, that will cut it in your book, I think it's page 155, uh, it indicates uh, reduction of funds by eliminating uh, vacant positions. Uh, in, in our effort, this is a goal uh, to implement legislation that we think um, would be helpful in helping the state reduce the amount of uh, funds that are wasted in that certified mail. Uh, as an agency, we send more than 200,000 pieces of mail that is certified. Uh, costing the state more than a million dollars. Uh, well, about 547,000 of that mill goes unopened. Uh, it's, never, it's never opened uh, by the recipient. Uh, we feel that in the reduction of uh, having to send that mail at $5.10 uh, per uh, mailing uh, from a certified format to a regular bulk uh, mailing, uh, it would save the state considerable dollars uh, and, and what we're proposing uh, in, in legislation that will be introduced to change this, uh, it will certainly help uh, our state achieve not just the goal uh, of, of eliminating um, waste, because that's what it is. You have, that mill comes back to my, our office. We hold it for a certain period of time. Uh, if it's not claimed or we cannot get it to the person uh, that it's intended to go to, it just goes in the shredder. Uh, so we, we uh, propose legislation that will help us meet uh, that $2,269,791 that's in line four of the license issuance program. And that essentially, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is the only item that is added to the 2021 budget that's not already in the amended 2020. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate to do this, but in order for us to stay on, on our allotted schedule. We're not going to have time for questions at this point, but I'm sure the commissioner will be glad uh, in the subcommittee hearings to answer any questions you may have at that point. Commissioner, thank you for being here. Yes, sir. And we appreciate your presentation. Thank you, sir. Next up is uh, Georgia Forestry Commission Director Chuck Williams. Another one we trained up in the house and he's gone on to do well. Director Williams, glad to have you with us. All these folks talking about cutting back on the use of paper, I'm, I'm a little concerned. All right, Director, thank you for being with us this afternoon, and the podium is yours. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Chairman Hill, I want to thank you and both of your respective committees and the members that are here today. It's a pleasure to be in front of you. Uh, I wanted to first lead off with, with stepping back a year ago and uh, thank both of you as well as then Governor Deal for the support that you gave us uh, on some pay parity 
funding. That did help us move the needle. Uh, we were able to get our starting ranger pay, the men and women that man the bulldozers and plow the fire lines. We were able to get starting pay for those folks, Mr. Chairman, up to $30,000 a year. And that is helping us uh, both uh, attract and retained. Uh, unlike the previous two agencies that I had the chance to listen to, most all of you have interacted with Department of Driver Services, you've interacted with GDOT, a lot of you probably have not interacted with the Georgia Forestry Commission. So I'm going to spend a little more time maybe than the last couple of presenters talking about our agency, maybe in a little less time on the specifics of our budget because really there's nothing, uh, there's nothing that jumps off the page uh, about our budget, but we'll talk about it as much as you want to. Our vision is, is pretty simple. It is that uh, we want to see healthy and abundant forests that support a robust industry while providing social, environmental, and financial benefits to all of Georgia. We do that through a mission statement, which is to provide leadership, service, and education in the protection and conservation of Georgia's forest resources. And for those of you that may not be familiar with why that is important, two out of three acres in Georgia is forested. As I have said, if the entire state of Georgia is getting a rainfall, two out of three of those raindrops are falling on forested land. Uh, so from an environmental and ecological standpoint, uh, the 22 million acres of commercial timberland in Georgia are critically important, not just to those landowners from an economic standpoint, uh, but from an ecological and environmental standpoint. Uh, we were pleased to hear the governor in his State of the State address when he was making the analogy to building a home on a strong foundation, talk about using Georgia lumber from Georgia forest, uh, uh, sawn in a Georgia sawmill. So uh, in keeping with the, with, with the governor's theme there, rather than have a PowerPoint presentation, we have handed you out uh, a little three-page handout printed on Georgia-grown paper sourced from Georgia-grown forest. And what that is, is, uh, is a snapshot, if you will, of our agency, sort of uh, the, the numbers that make us tick, uh, rolling stock, vehicle fleet, buildings, headcount of people, uh, equipment, including dozers and a small fleet of aircraft. The second page of that is just a snapshot of our historical state budget funding cycle. You can see the ups and downs. And then Chairman Hill and Chairman England, the third page of that is a Hurricane Michael update. Uh, unfortunately, we know that a lot of citizens in Georgia have moved on from Hurricane Michael. Uh, the Georgia Forestry Commission is still spending a lot of time in southwest Georgia assisting those landowners recover. I was down there last week. Folks, there's still, as some of you know, still blue tarps on roofs down there. Uh, there's still, in the, in the forestry world, a lot of damaged timber that was not able to be commercially salvaged that landowners are having to deal with. So that work continues. Uh, just a couple of things to point out out of the dollars that uh, the legislature uh, apportioned in the, uh, in the special session after, um, after Hurricane Michael, some of that money came our way. Uh, we worked in concert with Commissioner Gary Black in Ag and Department of Revenue in, in implementing the tax credit program, which is, which is now, I think, getting close to, to, to actually uh, telling folks what they've been approved for. Debris cleanup, uh, we, we, we took a few of the dollars that y'all allocated for debris cleanup and did some work with our own equipment and, and people helping landowners. Uh, we, we put in almost 10,000 hours on GFC dozers helping landowners clear up forest roads and fire breaks, primarily to help mitigate wildfire risk uh, if we have a wildfire breaks, that breaks out in all of that, all of that down timber. Uh, we worked closely with our federal partners on, uh, on helping them put uh, the federal programs on the ground and again, uh, $18.5 million uh, helping landowners through their resources and contractors clean up. We've helped communities, both cities and, and counties with their urban forestry issues. So again, uh, I just say that uh, to let you know that for us, Hurricane Michael is the gift that just keeps on giving and, uh, and, and we keep on trying to, to support the citizens of Georgia. Uh, our, our budget, as I mentioned, is, is fairly benign. We're obviously, uh, you know, working closely with the governor's office and OPB uh, as far as the directions we've been given there and the numbers that you have in front of you to reflect that. You know, our agency is, is, is fairly simple. I tell people that, uh, that we really operate off of, off of two or three components, and that is the human capital component, the rangers and the foresters and others that, that help those Georgia landowners, and the other part of that is the equipment that they need to do their job with, and that's, that's trucks, that's bulldozers, that's, again, a small fleet of aircraft. 
Uh, but for us, you know, as, as we look at where to find those efficiencies that, uh, that we've been uh, asked to find the, in the amended budget and the big budget, for us it really comes down to, uh, you know, our, our really our variable cost are people, diesel fuel, truck tires, bulldozer undercarriages, airplane maintenance and that type of thing. So uh, we will be working hard, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chairman, to, to find those efficiencies uh, and, and we will do our part, but uh, I would just say it's not going to be, uh, not going to be terribly easy. Uh, we have several different, different breakdowns as far as who does what. Uh, probably the ones that most of you are familiar with are forest protection, the folks that, that fight wildfire and help landowners uh, use good fire, prescribed fire, to mitigate wildfire risk and to help habitat. Forest management, uh, that's our foresters that work with Georgia's private landowners as well as uh, state-owned assets to help make sure that those forests are healthy and maintained and, and managed in, a, in an ecological, sustainable way. We have a small law enforcement division that, uh, that works primarily on, on forest arson and timber theft. Uh, I mentioned other, other properties. We have a couple of state forests that we manage, but uh, other than that, there are other state agencies that rely on us to help them manage their forest. Uh, GDOT, Corrections, DNR, we help those agencies uh, manage their forestry assets. Uh, really, we, we help all the state agencies except the University of Georgia with the forestry school. Uh, they do their, their own thing. We help the city of Atlanta. The city of Atlanta has two uh, forests, Paulin Forest and Dawson Forest, WMA, and under contract with them, uh, we basically manage those, those forests for them. Mr. Chairman, one thing I wanted to point out uh, to the group is for us, one of the challenges in, in meeting budget mandates and whatnot is the fact that we are a natural resources agency. And from that standpoint, uh, both good and bad, we're impacted by the weather. And what I mean by that is uh, if Georgia is seeing a, a wet spell, that means that, that normally we're spending less money on wildfire suppression, but it also means that we're probably plowing less fire breaks and, and assisting landowners with less prescribed fire. Uh, so, so we're not spending as much on wildfire, but we're not generating the revenue that we would otherwise uh, on prescribed burning. Uh, also, uh, sort of a little known fact is that, uh, is that different, the states in the country really have a very cooperative relationship on helping each other with wildfire incidents. So if, if, if out west, if Texas or Oklahoma or Louisiana, if somebody's having problems, uh, and particularly if, 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 we're, if we're having sort of a wet season and, and our folks are not terribly busy fighting wildfire, uh, we will send instant management teams and, and, and personnel out west. For us, it's a win-win. It's great training for our people to sort of see how other parts of the country do it, uh, to keep them up to speed. And also, generally, if they go out west on what we call assignment, they come off of our payroll. Uh, the state that they're going to and or the federal partners pick up uh, basically their base eight salary plus any overtime. So we're getting free training and they're coming off of our payroll, but obviously that, uh, that dynamic uh, is weather dependent as well. One little thing that we do, uh, I say little, some of my staff would disagree is, but uh, for several years now through a contractual arrangement uh, with the Environmental Protection Division, we read the irrigation meters in the state of Georgia uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and there's a lot of irrigation meters in the state of Georgia and, uh, and sometimes it, it stresses us to do that. Uh, but again, it's the classic win-win. It gets our people out in the field. It helps them learn the lay of the land and meet landowners that they might not would otherwise meet. But quite honestly, we're a bit proud that as Georgia appears to be, uh, to be uh, making some progress on the water wars, uh, the, the folks that have been working on that tell me that Georgia having good data on irrigation water usage has been, has been very critical uh, in how the, the special master has been viewing that. And again, we're the boots on the ground that are, that are reading those meters, and from that standpoint, uh, we're, we're proud of that. Uh, one, one area I did mention, reforestation. We do have a small nursery down in middle Georgia where we grow seedlings, both hardwood and pine, to help landowners. Uh, we don't do that to compete with the private sector. There are a number of private sector tree nurseries in the state. Actually, we work together. Uh, we're, we're a member of the NC State Tree Improvement Co-op, so uh, NC State and their researchers work on our seed orchard property, and we actually sell seed every year that we collect from our seed orchard to the private nurseries. So uh, anytime you may hear that, why is the state competing with the private sector? 
you know, I would say that our competition with the private sector is, is minimal. Our cooperation with them is, is significant and, and works much to the, to the benefit of Georgia. Uh, I mentioned economic impacts. Again, numbers bounce all around, but most people would say that direct economic impact to Georgia from forestry, some of you know this better in your districts than others, is, is somewhere between 32 and $36 billion. Uh, the, the indirect impacts are there. And also, uh, we're in conversation now with the Georgia Forestry Association and with UGA. A number of years ago, there was a research project done that attempted to quantify basically the, the non-forestry benefits of forestry. Uh, clean water, clean air, uh, vistas, you know, quality of life. Uh, we're looking at, at reprising that now and, and taking another look at that 10 or 15 years later because we think quite honestly that uh, probably those benefits actually are, yield a larger number uh, from a dollar standpoint than do, uh, than do the direct economic benefits. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I know I've sort of sped through that again. You have the budget numbers in front of you. Uh, I will be glad to respond to, to, to any questions that you, uh, that you may have, but, uh, but you see the numbers as, as well as we do. Again, we're still sort of absorbing the governor's budget number and, and looking at how we can, uh, can accomplish that, uh, probably like a lot of agencies. One thing we know we will do, and we've already actually proactively implemented, is what we call managing the laps, L-A-P-S-E, and that is if a ranger resigns from us and moves on, it takes a certain amount of time to post that job, advertise it, interview for it, and fill it, so you pick up some direct savings there just through the normal timeline. Uh, we've implemented a program now where, where we're not automatically filling any job within the commission, any job that becomes vacant for any reason. Uh, we're, we're analyzing sort of what the workload is expected to be for that job, what the other staffing is and whatnot, and trying to make sure that we're being very smart during these times that we're in as far as, as, far as filling those jobs. We obviously, as soon as the governor's directions came out for 4% and 6%, we started looking closer than we had before, and we were already looking very closely at travel expenses and expenditures and whatnot. You know, what we've told our staff in the field is, because, uh, you know, we, we, we've got a number of facilities, as you can see on that one pager, uh, if the roof is leaking and, and threatening the building integrity, patch it. If the shutters or the fascia boards need painting, hold off on it. And that's sort of the approach we're taking until this budget cycle plays itself out and we see exactly what the numbers are going to be and exactly how long, uh, you know, the budget pressures will, will be there. That's the approach we're taking. So, Mr. Chairman, with that, I don't know where I am on time, but I will gladly stand for any questions if there are any. I just thought Commissioner Nunn talked fast, but <clears throat> you may have him beat. <laughs> uh, Representative Petrie. Thank you, Mr. Director and former seatmate, and good to see you. Well done presentation. I wanted to tell you, and I think you know, I'm an uh, amateur tree farmer myself, I'm well aware we're number one in the country in timber production, and the economic benefit so important to Georgia. Um, I've been for some time frustrated with the cuts that it seems some agencies have gotten that have been hit harder than others, one of which I think is, is, is yours. And so to, uh, my question for you today is this, because I know I've worked with a lot of folks uh, at Georgia Forestry Commission from different offices over the years. The folks that really are competent tend to be there a while, then they move. Okay, we train them and they move somewhere else. So tell me the degree to which, because a lot of these folks aren't making a whole lot of money, the governor's proposal that would increase everybody below 40000 by $1,000, what percentage of your employees would be impacted by that improvement? That's my question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a, a definitive answer to that. Uh, since we just learned about that last week, uh, we're, we're looking at that. Uh, we, we're excited on one hand about that because I know we do have a number of individuals who are under 40. Again, up until, up until six months ago, we were starting rangers out at $27,300 and change. Uh, and it takes those folks a while to get to $40,000, obviously. Uh, we're now starting those folks at 30000 so we've still got folks under that. So we're excited about it, but we're also, uh, we're also I don't want to say trouble, but at this point, we're trying to determine what will be the salary compression issues there. If, if you've got somebody making $39,500 and you give them 
a thousand dollar raise, that may mean that they're making more than their immediate supervisor. So those compression issues are something that, that we're going to have to take a look at. I, I can get you a definitive number, uh, but for, for us, it is a significant number of folks that are under 40. Senator Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Williams, uh, don't really have a question, just a comment. I want to publicly thank you and your agency for the responsiveness uh, during the immediate uh, time after the storm, but uh, obviously a lot of my constituents were severely affected, and uh, since that time, you know, we've had to communicate a lot, and your, your, your folks have been very responsive, and I want to publicly thank you for, for your efforts and that leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm, I'm honored to work with the team that I work with. Thank you. Chair Lady Houston. Thank you, and thank you for what Forrester has always done with their budget. Y'all have really been mindful of the tax fast money. But I noticed that you're cutting personal services. Uh, are these jobs already filled, or are they vacant jobs that you're cutting, and how many people are affected? How many jobs are affected? At, at this point, Madam Chairman, it is a quote combination. Again, part of that is through managing this lapse process where we're just going to intentionally slow down the hiring process. Uh, you know, at, at this point, uh, we're still crunching the numbers uh, to see, you know, how we will manage through this. Uh, we, we all know what a lot of our agencies did back during the Great Recession when, when drastic measures were, were taken uh, on the personnel side. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't anticipate that at this point. Uh, but again, we're uh, positions that are open. We're certainly reassessing those and positions, as I said earlier, that come open we're reassessing those. I, so I don't have definitive numbers for you. We can obviously work with you and your analyst team to get whatever definitive numbers, but, uh, but we're looking at every position very closely. Uh, and one other question. Uh, what about impacting your equipment, the cuts in that? Is that going to be a problem or in the purchasing of equipment? Uh, I know with comfort, you have to stay on top of getting your everything up to speed in case you have a forest fire. Right, and, and obviously the, the, the bond package comes into play there. We actually in the past couple of years uh, have, have taken a serious look at, at not only what we buy, what you know you folks and, and the governor and the taxpayers of Georgia fund us with, but how we maintain that equipment, uh, making sure that, that, we're, that we're squeezing every bit of efficiency and, and economic life out of that equipment uh, that we can, uh, you know, this body has been very good to us over the last several mm -hmm. funding years, helping us upgrade, particularly our, our uh, fire suppression dozer fleet. Uh, over half of those dozers now have environmental calves to get those operators out of the, the smoke and the ash and, and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, uh, our, we're, we're, we're on a, a plan uh, from year to year to year on replacing that heavy equipment dozers and transports and whatnot, we, we feel better about that at this point than we do sort of the annual operating aspect okay. of what we do. And, and you do still have cabs, it's tractors, I mean, fire fighting equipment that don't have environmental cabs. Yes, ma'am, about, about half of our dozer fleet, and I think that fleet number is 300 and something units that's on the spreadsheet in front of you, about half of those have environmental cabs, about half do not have environmental cabs, but, uh, you know, I'll say this, I know Chairman England can, can relate to this. He understands the equipment world very well. We, we've got some of our older, I don't want to say older, some of our more seasoned <laughs> rangers that, that say, I prefer that open cab. I can see, I can feel, I can smell what's going on with that wildfire. Don't, don't put me behind glass. Uh, so we will probably continue to have some of that older equipment for a while. Uh, and quite honestly, it tends in some ways to be more dependable than the new equipment. Well, I guess with, with, thank you. But we appreciate the new equipment. Don't misunderstand me. <laughs> we, thank you, Mr. We Chairman. We're almost out of time. Uh, so be the last one. Uh, yeah, but real quickly, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing us the quick question. Uh, Commissioner, real quick, um, I, you know, you have a lot of uh, vehicles on your on your sheet right here, and, and, and again, you know, we look at truck HD and truck LD. You know, a lot of emergency type uh, vehicles. Just give us an idea of what you're dealing with there, if you don't mind. And, yes, and I know very quick answer. 
and, and be glad to. Truck H D is heavy duty equipment, either ten wheel, what we call straight trucks that are moving the smaller class of dozers, or uh, eighteen wheelers, uh, you know, road tractors pulling low boys that are that are pulling the the bigger dozers. Uh, in South Georgia, so that's the heavy duty fleet that basically for the most part moves bulldozers, light duty trucks or F-250s that chief rangers are driving, F-150s that foresters are driving and those type vehicles. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Director, I'm sorry we're out of time. I know we've got a couple more that had questions, but just ask them to catch you on the way out if, if they can. But appreciate what you do and especially what your folks in the field do. Um, Again, I'd echo the, the sentiments from others uh, on the response from the hurricane in October 2018 and <clears throat> continuing as we, as we have storms and other outbreaks. Uh, Y'all are always Johnny on the spot, and we appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honored to be in front of you today. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Next up, another well-trained former House member, DNR Commissioner. Mark Williams um, and Judd Turner, I think, is going to, or excuse me, Richard Dunn. I, I'm still living in the past. Um, but uh, Commissioner, appreciate you being here, and Director Dunn, appreciate you being here as well. And the microphone is yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, last year I got to open up with some great news for Chairman Hill that I was increasing his constituency with twin grandbabies and uh, pleased to say today that uh, although those have moved out of your district, I'm increasing Senator Tillery's constituency by four grandbabies. So for those of you that can do the math in this committee, I know it's appropriations. My daughter has had uh, two sets of twins in less than 20 months. So we're all happy. We had an interesting Christmas. I pick, picked out my son's Christmas present at CVS didn't take very much wrapping paper, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, but thank you for having me. Department of Natural Resources uh, budget can be found on pages 252 and 254 of the Governor's Budget Report. Have a few primary changes in our FY20 budget I'd like to make you aware of. In regard to vehicle replacement, our law enforcement division is slated to receive 10 vehicles at 300,000. State Parks and Historic Sites Division, seven vehicles at 200,000. Wildlife Resources, 17 vehicles at a cost of 500,000. And I wanna thank, thank uh, the governor for this uh, appropriation very much and thank y'all for your support on it to keep our aging fleet going. Uh, if you notice, in looking at the numbers, it's pretty obvious law enforcement vehicles take a lot more to outfit, so you get less for the money, but that's, that's the difference there. In terms of regular operating expenses, DNR is reducing costs within each division. DNR is conserving personnel costs by mostly holding open vacant positions. In addition, there are a couple of items unique to certain divisions. Historic preservation will reduce funds for the Georgia Heritage Grant Program. Parks will reduce funds for equipment. Wildlife resources will lower some investment in facility repairs and maintenance. Wrapping up AFY20, um, WRD has budgeted an increase of $310,051 from lifetime sportsman license sales to support the wildlife endowment fund. So that has been on a good trend upward for lifetime licenses. Moving on to the 21 budget, Department of Natural Resources can be found on pages 254 through 257 of the governor's budget report. FY21 will bring the first appropriated funds for the new Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Program. Earlier today, the, G the Outdoor Stewardship Board of Trustees met and approved a slate of 14 projects, ranging from conservation and recreation, projects of local and regional significance to state land acquisitions. DNR will also be transforming the Historic Preservation Division. I know you already heard from Direct uh, Commissioner Nunn to the Department of Community Affairs in FY21. DNR will retain the archeology span team under the Parks Division while DCA will administer the remaining programs. For the last 26 years, DNR has guided the state's historic preservation efforts through the Historic Preservation Division. After discussions between DCA, DNR, and OPB, it was concluded 
that the Historic Preservation Division and its mission would best serve Georgia citizens under the umbrella of the Department of Community Affairs. This transition will streamline the process for many future customers, including local communities in their downtowns, as they also interact with DCA through comparable tax credit grant, tax credit grant and development programs. This seamless streamlining will achieve the governor's initiatives for agencies to continually offer better service to the customers of the state. This move will establish an efficient and effective one-stop shop with the goal of improving Georgia communities through intentional engagement with historical places and properties. DNR as well is slated to take over the management of two state visitor senators, Plains and Sylvania from the Department of Economic Development, and that's found on line 14 in Parks. DNR will shift telecommunications costs from a budget item under departmental administration to items under each division as a housekeeping measure only. In regard to reductions, each division will continue to seek efficiencies in regular operations as similarly listed in AFY 20. Lastly, there are a couple of items unique to certain divisions, including equipment purchases and advertising for parks and facility repairs and maintenance for WRD that will see some continued reductions in FY21. Parks will also eliminate multiple one-time pass-throughs and WRD will place funds for the Sapelo Island Ferry through a contract, I know you heard Russell McMurray say, with Geo, uh, George D, G. Dot by 500,000. And I think he would, he would look real good on the coast in my opinion. While there are, are more than a few changes in both, both of these budgets, DNR is confident that it will be able to serve Georgians department-wide without any lapses. We are fully committed to protecting our coastal resources, defending our citizens, managing our parks and historic sites, and in conserving our wildlife. We're excited to continue working on the responsibilities charged to us by this General Assembly and our governor. And now, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it over to Director Dunn. Good afternoon, Chairman England, Chairman Hill, members of the House and Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for, uh, for us to discuss the governor's amended fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21 budget recommendation for the Environmental Protection Division. I'm assuming we're working off the governor's budget book, is that correct? Uh, so EPD has three programs under DNR. As Mark said, those are on pages 252 to uh, page 257. Our three programs are number one, environmental protection. Uh, the second program is the hazardous waste trust fund. And the third program is the solid waste trust fund. Those are the three programs administered by EPD. Uh, the base budget for those three programs is about $121 million in total funds. About 32% or 38 million uh, are appropriated state funds. Uh, I'll start off with the amended budget, uh, do the environmental protection program first, the first item there, and I'm just I'm going to go item by item, and uh, I think that's the best way for us to do it. Uh, the first item under the environmental protection program is a statewide change, that is a statewide adjustment to DOAS risk pools. I won't say much about that. The next two items uh, address our 4% budget reduction. Uh, for both, I will say for both amended and the big budget, our budget reductions prioritize those savings that had minimal or no impact on our current operations. So item number two there is a reduction in travel expenses. That's a reduction of about $100,000. Our expenditures as a division of DNR annually are about $420,000. Most of that travel is what I would call essential travel. Travel for our employees for inspections, complaint investigations, emergency response, technical assistance, and for public meetings. What we're focused upon on the savings is what I would call non-essential travel, such as travel to out-of-state conferences or to internal meetings. What we're trying to do is when you're traveling at the request of a conference organizer out of state and they've asked you to speak, we expect that organizer to pay for your travel, not the state. 
Uh, another example of that is when there's an important conference, national conference, we, we employ a lot of engineers, a lot of geologists, a lot of modelers. There's a lot of national conferences that are important for them to go to. When you do travel to that conference, only sit one person for the program, not multiple people. Uh, another idea here that we're implementing is for our internal meetings. We have a lot of folks uh, situated throughout the state. We regularly have meetings, for example, in Macon or here in Atlanta. We're going to do a lot of those meetings via teleconference. And we've implemented this uh, beginning October 1, and currently we're on track for that $100,000 in savings in our travel expenses. Item number three is a replacement of state funds with federal funds for contractual services. There are a lot of moving parts underneath this caption, and I'm going to share those moving parts with the House and Senate budget staff, but let me just speak broadly here. Our strategy for this reduction is we're freeing up federal funds, which makes up about 25% of our budget. We're freeing up some federal funds to replace some state funds, which we then take as a uh, reduction. Again, I don't want to go into detail, but let me give you an example. Uh, in our water program, we had plans for this fiscal year and for next fiscal year over a two-year period to update uh, a contract that models the impact of water withdrawals and wastewater returns on downstream surface water flows and water quality. We looked at that contract. We originally budgeted for $3 million. We looked at the scope of that contract, trued up the cost. We were able to get the cost of that contract down to about $1.3 million. We can then take those federal fund savings and replace some state fund dollars that we can cut. For example, we're funding uh, four months of rent for our state lab in Peachtree Corners. We're using federal funds instead of state funds to fund uh, that four months of rent. Another example, we're using it for some personal services. Some folks that were previously supported with 100% state funds, they will now be supported with some of those freed up federal funds. In the amended budget, there were no changes in the hazardous waste trust fund or the solid waste trust fund programs. Move to the big budget now, which starts out again in the Environmental Protection Program, which is at the top of page 255. Uh, item one is a statewide change to TRS contributions. We do have one employee who is a participant in TRS, so that represents the adjustment for that employee. Uh, the second item is a statewide GETS contract adjustment. Item number three is the governor's pay raise for full-time employees making under $40,000 a year. We have about 186 employees, that's about 25% of our workforce that would be eligible for that increase if it were to stay in the budget. And the $129,531 there added represents the state portion of this increase. Item number four is similar to the federal state fund swap I discussed in the amended budget. Again, Mr. Chairman, rather than going into details here, I will provide the details uh, to the House and Senate Budget Office staff of all the moving pieces. There's about seven or eight moving pieces and be happy to answer any questions at, at subcommittee or whenever uh, that is needed. Item number five is the same $100,000 savings we have in travel that we took in the amended budget. Uh, skip down to the hazardous waste trust fund program. As this committee knows, the trust fund is associated with two types of fees. The first fee is a, what's called a solid waste fee. This is essentially a 75 cent per ton tipping fee at landfills throughout the state that we collect and remit to the state treasury. Uh, the second fee associated with the Hazardous Waste Trust Fund are fees on companies that generate, manage, and store hazardous waste. Last year, uh, HB 220 reduced uh, the solid waste tipping fee from 75 cents to 51 cents per ton, effective July 1, 2020. Caption number one under the Hazardous Waste Trust Fund program proposes allocating 100% of the new projected tipping fee revenue to EPD effective with the FY21 base budget. So once the, the tipping fee has been reduced from 75 cents to 51 cents, and what's in the governor's budget is appropriation of 100% of the projected revenue from that new tipping fee to EPD. And that increases the base budget from $4 million to about $8.3 million. Uh, the last two budget items are under the Solid Waste Trust Fund Program on page 256. Uh, the Solid Waste Trust Fund is funded primarily by a fee charged on each replacement passenger tire sold in the state. Last year, again, HB 220 reduced the replacement passenger tire fee from $1 per tire to $0.38 cents per tire, effective July 1, 2020. 
Item one that you see under the Solid Waste Trust Fund program trues up the base budget for the Solid Waste Trust Fund with the projected collections from the reduced tire fee, which is approximately 20, an increase of $26,758. That leaves the new base budget for the Solid Waste Trust Fund at $2.8 million. That is the amount of money we're expected to collect from the new 38, the reduced 38, to 38 cents uh, fee on each replacement tire sold in the state. Uh, the second item under the Solid Waste Trust Fund is the transfer of a contract supporting the Keep Georgia Beautiful Foundation from DCA to EPD. That $175,000 contract will now be supported by the Solid Waste Trust Fund. I will also mention we do have one item in the capital budget. Uh, that is for $900,000 for our lab, again out in Peachtree Corners, is to replace some aging equipment. We've got eight pieces of equipment that need to be replaced. It's no longer supported by the manufacturer, and that uh, capital, those capital funds will allow us to do that replacement. Mr. Chairman, that's uh, every item, I believe, in the governor's budget, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. All righty. <clears throat> I don't know if Rick, if this question is for you or the commissioner, but uh, Senator Lucas. He lit up early this uh, afternoon. Hey, no question about it. I didn't want to get caught not being able to ask you. Uh, Mr. Stutt, yes, sir. Uh, if you would, I, I would like for you to, to see Representative Jackson. Uh, I was at a meeting that was in Tunnel, Georgia, and there's a plant that's been closed, and they're looking to do a well, and it seems that whatever was there at that plant is affecting the water table. And so it might need to be a cleanup. Uh, the other question is for the commissioner, because Commissioner Wilson said on economic development that they turn everything over to DNR. And of course, Commissioner, you and I are uh, avid outdoorsmen. But George Bagby State Park, uh, people don't have to worry about getting sick because we put a clinic down there now. That's run by Mercer. But it's a state park that has enormous amenities. But across the lake, which is called Eufaula, they're doing great with fishing tournaments, golf tournaments, and everything. What is being done for economic development in Clay County for that park that we've got a, a bunch of money in? Um. You're talking about uh, George Bagby State Park? I am. Because Clay in general, we have in Florence Marina and Clay. It, it, we have another state park that does real well. Um, uh, it's uh, no secret that park has struggled. Uh, we are working on a plan. I can't roll it out to you completely today, but uh, I will come by your office and, 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 uh, and uh, get your input on it shortly. Well, you, you got to go through several legislators. It's not my district. I know, I know, I know. But I, I will definitely get with a delegation. But I know you've had a specific interest in that part. All right. And we will. I will call Representative Jackson first thing in the morning. Chairman Knight. Thank you, um, Commissioner. That Christmas was hectic. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. Um, Thank you, Commissioner. I know we, we share a big love of, uh, of the outdoors. And in looking at this, this budget, I noticed that, again, there was, there was quite a few cuts, especially from the areas that uh, involve the, the men and women, the sportsmen and women who hunt and fish. When I go back to, and again, HB 208, when we wrote, you know, we, 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 we supported and, you know, DNR through the public uh, um, uh, forum, got out and, you know, Asked the sportsmen and women did they want to contribute more of their fees so that we could increase the access and increase management and all that uh, across Georgia. And um, it looks, again, it looks right here that, that we're, we're making significant cuts to that. So uh, I don't know if we're increasing access in this budget. And, and again, <laughs> the sportsmen and women stepped up and paid for it. I mean, you had long discussions about this. So. Yeah. Uh, how we, is this we, going to we, we definitely have a report card, and, and, and Chairman, I know you have great interest because we share a lot of the same passions. And I'm pleased to say we, we're living up to the report card that we took out to the people. 
uh, we we ask our division directors in parks and and, and all and WRD to to make targeted cuts, with the guidance that this does not affect our customers. Um, and and I feel like they did a great job. I mean, in the last year, we we've expanded our hours on PFAs. We've brought camping overnight to PFAs and hope to expand that. We've got now 126,000 acres signed up in the D, uh, DMAP program um, and uh, I, hundreds of miles of new roads. We've added 4,000 um, acres to uh, waterfowl uh, habitat. And, and one I'm most proud of, and it really only involves legislators in these 11 counties up here in Metro, is our urban wildlife program. Um, I watch the Atlanta news when I'm up here, but it, not when I'm in Jessup, but uh, when I, where I live, a coyote runs through somebody's backyard and it's just a coyote running through the backyard. You don't <laughs> call anybody, but it's a little different and I get that. I wasn't raised up here, so it took me a little while to get it, but I get it. And you know, especially when a bear shows up on somebody's back porch in Cobb County. Well, we weren't telling that story. Uh, People were calling everybody but us, and that was part of our fault. We didn't, we didn't tell people we're the agency that can help you. And we put together a team, you can call it a strike team or whatever, that can respond. And just in the last, we've, it's been stood up about four months, really going full tilt. We've answered over 300 calls. I don't know how many deer we've gotten out of people's fences. And so now, instead of the sheriff Whoever else gets the call, finally it gets to us, it goes straight to us, and it's the state of Georgia showing up there to get that wounded owl or to get that bear off somebody's back porch or try to trap it and relocate it. So I'm real proud of that. So we, we, we have targeted our cuts, and um, I, I, I'll stand by my statement, uh, Chairman Knight, that um, I, I don't think our customers are gonna see any, any and a lot of that's a result of 208 because that did help the first license increase in 29 years. So we've been able to keep those things going. Chair Lady Smith. Thank you. Um, and this is a general question both to Rick Dunn, Director of EPD, and to Mark Williams, Commissioner of DNR. One of you makes it possible for Georgia citizens to enjoy all our natural resources beautiful showcase it the other makes sure it's clean and safe while we do it your jobs are not easy but I've noticed there are several just agency shifts and changes underneath your groups and so I'm already getting texts from different legislators what what's going on here and there so um, hello and looking forward to your presentations to the subcommittee <laughs> again in that same line with asking my division directors to streamline but don't affect the customer we, in WRD, we've gone from seven regions to six. You still got the same people out there, but you don't have a central office and a whole nother central office to staff. So we put more boots on the ground. And we also, did I say WRD? Um, and we also did that in law enforcement. So that's, you're hearing some of that. Your counties will, should see the same rangers unless that particular ranger has asked for a transfer, but it didn't affect the boots on the ground but it's gonna save us a lot of money through attrition and just a whole nother office being open. And uh, Chairman Smith, uh, as I mentioned, our cuts were specifically designed to minimize any impact on our operations and I believe we've accomplished that, so thank you. Representative Henson. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. The first is about coyotes, <laughs> since you brought it up. Either if you can handle this. So you're telling me that regarding the coyotes that run around my neighborhood, which is quite well populated, I'm supposed to call you, not you personally, but your department. Right. We, we, have a, we have an urban uh, wildlife program. Right, so I can get that number from your department name, and I can put it out to my constituents. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, her name is Caitlin Goode um, and uh, she runs that department and 
Hopefully, your sheriff and, and your county folks have that number, but we can certainly get it to you as well. That's what they're there for. Thank you. And the second question I have, and I know you said it got moved out of your department, is Keep Georgia Beautiful. And it's being moved to DCA. But, and I guess I wish you had presented first so I'd understand it all, but are we still having Keep Georgia Beautiful and is it still filtering down to the counties that you will have their own, like in my case, keep the cab beautiful? Yes, thank you. Uh, just to clarify, the contract is being moved from DCA to the Solid Waste Trust Fund, which oh. is administered by EPD. Uh, I don't have a lot of details on that contract yet, but we, Representative Henson, but we'll certainly plan on, uh, if, that, if that language stays, is to administer just like it's been administered before. And that comes under you. The Solid Waste Trust Fund, yes, ma'am. Senator Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Dunn, on the tipping fee that you mentioned for the solid waste, you said it had gone from 75 cents to 51 cents. Yes, sir. And you made a point, I think, of saying 100% of that was going to go to EPD. Where's it been going? Uh, the counties or? <laughs> uh, you know, we, Senator Walker, as you know, we collect the fee, uh, we remit it to state treasury, and this body decides to appropriate back out to the Solid Waste Trust Fund. So uh, I, I don't track where every dollar goes, I track the dollars that we're appropriated, that we collect and send to treasury, and what we're appropriating and what we spend, and I'll have to leave it at that. Okay, so who decided, I mean, so it's not going to go in the general fund? It, it will still be going into the general fund. What this budget item does, for example, in the solid waste. So 100 percent of it. Correct. That's the governor's recommendation. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh huh. Representative Thomas. Uh, yes, I just wanted to follow back up. Uh, did you say that the there's a reduction in the heritage grants and it also that department uh, that uh, area had been shifted to the Department of Community Affairs. There is a reduction in the, the heritage grants just as a budget reduction and then um, there is a shift from historic preservation. I think it's 19 employees, but all the money goes with them to DCA. It's just a better home for them from a customer service standpoint. Oh, so what, what is the um, reduction in the uh, grant program? I will get you that exact figure. I just don't have it right in my head. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Chairman Workheiser. Thank you. And uh, since the commissioner is my constituent, just wanted to brag on, uh, because they, they really don't get the notice. When we have a natural disaster, is it, in not only in uh, what happened in southwest Georgia, but, ever, but others, and it really doesn't fall in their domain, uh, but I've seen firsthand uh, their workers working 24 hours when the, such as in southwest georgia when we were waiting on federal funds to to move debris uh dnr stepped up to the plate and did an incredible work uh while we we're waiting on the federal government so thank you thank you all right mr commissioner and director dunn looks like y'all have uh managed to answer all the questions next time we'll put you on early because it seemed to have more questions earlier in the day and getting later in the day, evidently they, they don't have as many questions. So we'll, we'll note that for next year. Ladies and gentlemen, that completes today's testimony. Uh, Nine o'clock start in the morning uh, promptly. We'll have Chief Justice Melton with us with Georgia Supreme Court. And we'll run the morning dealing with courts and public safety. We are adjourned for the day.